So I think then we have everyone with us for the morning session and uh, everyone is connected and, and up and running. Um, I think that you all know me besides Mad, so it's nice to meet you virtually. Um, <laughs> what, and uh, we have another a reviewer with us, Matt Pergiana Mozoka. And so I'll introduce you two together after I just run through our project for the semester. Um, and hopefully this will explain to you what uh, I've been prompting our students to think about for the semester and um, to have consider in their, in their curriculum. These are third year students and um, in their sixth semester of design studio. So these are our Bachelor of Architecture students and the theme of the intermediate studio that they're in is speculation. So it's one that really contributes to their uh, maybe more theoretical or um, experimental thinking. So that's sort of a behind the scenes driver for what I've attempted to really push them into doing. Um, and please um, interrupt me if you have a question as I'm going along. Um, you don't have to wait. It's, it's very informal. So the uh, studio that I've put together this semester, I've called Fun Palace 2.0. Uh, Fun Palace 1.0 was uh, one that was created through the work in the 60s by Cedric Price and in collaboration with Joan Littlewood, a theater director, and also with uh, Gordon Pask, who was a cybernetician at the time, all of those in England, experimenting around the work of the Architectural Association. So you might be familiar more so with Cedric Price and the work of mm -hmm. his more avant-garde thinking and how that's sometimes contributed to projects we see in this in our contemporary world, but more so, I would say, um, a lot of the work of Archigram and all of the offshoots of that. And so um, mm -hmm. the, the subtitle of the semester was Practices of Indeterminacy. So we're looking at ways that a fun palace or thinking about a fun palace could um, direct some sort of social input and interactivity from its users, thinking about the cybernetic part to their collaboration. I also wanted to prompt them to think about current global issues and circumstances. And this was prior to our uh, COVID-19 situation. So mm -hmm. before this all came about, we were sort of really trying to think about some of the um, issues at hand and social revitalization. And uh, it's interesting how this has actually become something uh, of a more relevant um, circumstance. And then to be for the students to be open to uncertainty or flexibility and adaptability in their design. So there's a nature of temporality in the project itself or the three projects that uh, that they worked on throughout the semester. And then to also maybe consider if there's any innovative uses of technology and sustainable systems. So those were sort of premises that the original Fun Palace set up to be thinking of in the 1960s. And so I want the students to reflect on that as a precedent and consider what our current, current understanding of these topics might be. Mm -hmm. um, sounds, sounds great. Okay, and so in the first uh, assignment, they just worked in pairs to do a little bit of research on what the Fun Palace was. So it the really the only document that exists of it um, in its original sort of formulation of the from the collaborators was this uh, plan and section, which is somewhat misleading in its uh, inexactness and also its. Um, sort of disconnect from one thing to the other. But what we did was divide it up into lots and have each team work on a certain plot and both vertically and horizontally having to uh, discuss and, and have a conversation or collaboration with the neighboring plot. Um, and so thinking about how 
uh, that circumstance of negotiation might come about when you're working with a system, but that one that has flexibility and some adaptability. Um, and so the students um, created these models in pairs that would all stack together and be one, but that in a sense also took on their own sort of individual uh, recognition of what the parts and the pieces are, thinking about the flexibility that the uh, Fun Palace spelled out for them. Some of the movement or action may not be fully conveyed in this um, looping model, but it was one that they could focus on their own individual programs. So program and flexibility of program was one thing that they really um, tested and tried to develop in a creative way in the first project. In the second project, uh, which I call performing architecture, they again worked in teams of two to three and built an interactive one-to-one -one piece that would have them think about the construction of a model and a performance piece that would trigger some sort of social act or social interaction um, up for their own device. So teams worked on different ones and you'll see that in the project, some of them have uh, explicitly used the work or investigation from assignment two to develop then what their, their third uh, project might be. So we looked in the second project at artists like Alan Wexler's uh, Coffee Seeks Its Own Level or uh, apparatuses like the clothing of Rebecca Horn. So thinking about full scale one to one apparatus or piece that could trigger uh, a spatial influence. We then um, after the second project, we're able to venture out and as a studio, look at the site that we were going to be using for our final project. We went on a kayaking trip and um, floated around together in pairs, but also had our, our site discussion out on the water. So the site that we're developing is directly on the Colorado River and uh, is one that um, talks or speaks to the ideas of temporality or uh, interactivity, the idea of dynamic space that is flexible and constantly shifting or moving. So I wanted them to really understand that from a, a personal um, experience and that we sometimes don't always consider that sort of alternative view or user's perspective when we are looking at a condition. So the third assignment, which is primarily what you'll be looking at today is the interactive theater. Again, considering the work of the Fun Palace and particularly the investigations of their collaborator, Gordon Pask, who was a cybernetician and to think about a cybernetic theater and what that would mean in this sort of speculative world of performance and temporality. We also, uh, to add another layer onto this, um, thought about air structures. So you'll see how each project potentially deals with an air structure or not. Some really felt that the temporality was uh, dealt with in a different way, but that we could consider that the site on um, the Colorado River is one that is uh, it's oftentimes used throughout the year by the city of Austin or other private organizations as a kind of pop-up temporal event, or it could have a kind of pop-up temporal nature just because of the, the existence of the trail and the park-like setting that the Colorado offers us. Um, they were meant to deal with a, a fairly open and broad program, a minimal amount of say requirements like cafe and seating, uh, restrooms, uh, service and mechanical wasn't really um, dealt with other than you know they needed to provide something of that nature. The performance agenda is really the, the primary direction of the programmatic investigation. And they were also given the list of um, programs that the subcommittee to the Fun Palace actually created back in the 60s. So those were fairly sort of 
avant-garde requests by that subcommittee and and also dealt with sort of speculative program thinking, which is something that I've really pushed them to do in this studio. So again, I just want to remind you that the studio is meant to be uh, focused on speculation. So I actually reminded students that oftentimes as architects, we, we deal with um, major directions of speculation when we enter competitions where we're not doing a practical project, we're doing one that sometimes has a bit of fantasy or uh, sometimes um, a degree of playfulness that we can't always get away with in our uh, practices. And so you'll see a little bit of that um, with each project, I hope. And I think that was all I was going to mention today. So this morning we have with us Pergiana Mazoka and Matt Luck. We'll be looking at four projects. I don't think that we'll have any um, issue with timing. Um, students, if, like I said, if we could turn on our videos so that we could all be uh, viewed and see each other, I think that that would be helpful just for our discussion. Um, just uh, to introduce uh, Matt Pergiana to you, she is our Emerging Scholar and Design Fellow at UTSOA this, for the next two years. So this is her first year here. She's an, architecture, an architect and researcher um, whose uh, relationship to biopolitics and aesthetics are ones that we've been able to really benefit from uh, her as a reviewer and as a, a colleague and as a professor. She studied in um, fantastic places and has worked in uh, many places in Europe and was most recently the Wortham Fellow at Rice University. And Matt, unfortunately, they didn't really give me much on your bio. And when I tried to look it up, I didn't really want to make any assumptions. So do you want to introduce yourself a little bit further than um, what I have here? Matt? Can you hear me? Sorry, Matt? my audio is... I can, yeah. How's this? Do you um, want to so just can, um, give us a brief introduction? Sure. Is my audio okay? I mean, can you hear? Yes. Can you hear me pretty clearly? Okay, great. Yeah. Um. So I um. I uh, grew up um. On a farm in uh, in Western Kentucky. I did my undergraduate um, architecture studies there at Kentucky. Um. I went to work. Um. Uh, for Frank Harmon in North Carolina for three or four years. And then I did my graduate studies at Cornell. And um, after that, I uh, became the um, senior project uh, architect for Rick Joy Architects in um, Tucson, Arizona for about nine years. And just recently, uh, my wife and I, Sarah, started our own architecture firm in Austin, Texas uh, last August. And we're working on a new hotel project that's going to go on the um, the north side of the river or lake. I'm learning that it depends on who you're talking to, but uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and then we have some other projects. We have a uh, hostel project um, in Denver, which is a few blocks from Coors Field, which is an addition and a renovation. And we're doing some other small things. But um, this project's really exciting for me. Um, um, it, it'll be uh, I'm interested to see what the students have done. Uh, one of my professors was Lebius Woods, and I was at Peter Eisenman at Cornell, and um, this project um, um, has a certain playfulness to it that reminds me of some of the work that we accomplished there. So anyway, thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to hear from all of you. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. So unless there are any other questions, um, I think we'll get started. Lindsay, are you ready to share your screen? Or would you like for me to present and you tell me when to move the slides? Lindsay? Lindsay, are you there? 
Does anyone? Lindsay, are you there? Lindsay, I think you're muted. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. It's okay. It's okay. Do you want me to do you, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, I'll share my screen. Okay. One second. Okay. All right. Um, do you see it all right? We do, but we also see it as a presenter's view. So you might want to switch that. So. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know why it's showing me that one. Normally when I press that, it, it doesn't. Right, go to slideshow, slideshow tab. Mm -hmm. And then turn off, well, uh, go back to that. Okay. Um, uh, use time to show me. See where it says use presenter view? You need to unclick that. At the very end, the last, no, last, last, there. From the beginning, yeah. So um, for assignment two, my partner and I created a periscope. You want to go back to your first slide yeah. and just introduce yourself and your type. Your... Yeah. Um, I'm Lindsay. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, the main concept behind my, my project is um, projection and using um, our periscope from assignment two as a, uh, as a major driver for the, um, the project from a conceptual standpoint. And um, the concept behind a periscope was it was meant to be a device to allow two different people to see eye to eye, rather than to look up to someone or to look down on someone. Um, since those phrases carry like heavy connotations, not just from like an eye level point of view, but uh, like your opinion of someone. So the building itself was meant to be a, to act as a device at a larger scale and how you can use projection to create that, that cybernetic experience in which people are both watching and being watched. And so um, it's, it's organized into these different programmatic spaces where you have your reflection theater, refraction theater, and shadow theater. And these were supposed to play on um, those effects of illusion in different ways where you have these three cones that are above ground, one facing the park over the water, and another one inviting people down from the trail with uh, the program, some of the program buried underneath. So it's not too obstructive to the uh, Austin skyline. And here's a plan view. And it, what I was really trying to show here was the shadow theater and how it it plays on um, light coming from different angles and different colors and the mixing in different ways. Where here it shows it going through it with a transparent screen. So then with the cafe, you'd be able to, um, to experience that projection. And here is a GIF showing what it would look like if you were in that cafe, how it, it has this double function of both being in a cafe where you, you, could, you could eat, but also the function of being like a, like a theater space where you can watch the people on the other side and um, the other side could be like a, like a dance hall, like a nightclub or the natural like movement of people creates this interesting experience of shadows moving and changing color. And then here's a section demonstrating uh, the periscope from the, the north-south axis. And here it shows someone in this theater space and how they can look down into it and see both the performance, but also the through the, um, the, the two periscopes that then project your view out over here um, through the it's over the water. So you can see like, for example, someone in a kayak could come up and, and see over through the other side, how it has that double feature, very similar to uh, 
the periscope from that that image that I showed you guys earlier. And um, it would go like through through the cafe so the people underneath would be here, but because because the um, the shorter it would go over their heads, so it would go go through the space. And here's an image of um, what it would look like if someone was kayaking, how it, it's open up to the water. So it would be like a little nook where people can actually kayak up to that, that space and have that connection to the, the theater space on the other side. And then here's what it would look like in yeah, the reflection theater, I'm calling it, where it has that projected view out into the water, how it goes down and then back up to the other side and how it has this faucet mirror effect. So um, it creates these multiple images of people. So it's not just about the uh, performer down on the stage, but also the, uh, the people themselves become part of the appearance of the building and become part of the, the, the performance. And that's it. Thank you, Lindsay. So uh, if the two reviewers want to unmute themselves, um, I think we can start the discussion. And students as well, if you're interested in offering your opinions or in critique, I don't think that it's just for us to be critiquing you, but you can definitely be part of the conversation as we always hope to do. I agree with that. Please students speak up. That would be nice. Um, so maybe I can start. Uh, I don't know, Matt, if, if you have like some pressing comment. Please go ahead. All right, um, Lindsay, maybe I, I just wanted to um, ask you to maybe clarify how uh, the Periscope mechanism works. Like in what ways do you see, you know, like, um, um, the artifacts that allow for the, the periscope to, to work, in what ways they have been materialized within the project. Is there, um, I see from your images that, you know, some of the surfaces of the cones, right? Uh, let's mm -hmm. call them tessellated cones, uh, have some mirrors. So I'm just curious, you know, like if, if there is um, a little bit of, of, of clarity in the ways in which you have used materiality and the components and mechanisms uh, of the periscope and how they're manifested within the project. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, um, it's really the using mirrors, these angled mirrors um, from the section and how it would just be, um, it would be two of them really to create first goes up and then out and then up and out again. So it, it would just be based on 45 degree mirrors because um, that's that's how you um, how periscopes really work is it, it's just that 45 degree mirror and then it uses reflectivity in in this one cone but that's not really so much a like a periscope as much as it is just creating these um, reflections at different angles. Sure. But then, for example, like um, not only are those mirrors um, present for allowing the periscope to work, but they also create like the background for the stage. They also create like a sort of uh, background or like um, space where things are projected, right? So I, I just want to understand like in what ways you materialized, you know, the, um, the mechanisms of the periscope into architectural components that helped you, you know, organize the spaces within, you know, the structure that you're creating. So maybe if you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's really how I got the form of the cones was because I wanted it a backdrop, like you said, for the, for the stage without it. Um, so that's why it's like smaller there, but then bigger out as you go back is because I wanted it to, to really scope your view, to be, be like that funnel where it focuses in onto that one point. All right, yeah. So maybe, you know, like my first comment to you um, would be to work a little bit more on, you know, how you present your ideas and how, you know, your concepts are materialized, not just, you know, as a, um, as, you know, I did this, the Periscope produces this, and this is the result. 
so that maybe you can uh, dwell a little bit more on you know how how that process that that thought process allowed you to create space right um, mm -hmm. and also how the representation might help you uh, to translate those ideas into you know their final um, spatial qualities right so that being said I think that you know, you had this exploded axonometric that only deals with program. But I think like um, for me, the program, at least in, in your project is less interesting. I think like what it's most interesting to me is like how a technology, right? Like, or an artifact gets translated into an ar architectural object, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what I find like interesting also for you guys, like as a, as a general comment for everyone. Uh, since you're dealing with the uh, fond palace, right? Like there was this fascination with technology. There was like um, this idea in which, you know, you can create an artifact that could be appropriated differently. So it doesn't matter right now if it's a reflection theater or not, or if it has a cafe or not, right? It's just like the act of, you know, inhabiting a technological artifact, right? Which is mm. most important. So for me, it would have been great to have like, you know, maybe technical drawings to understand right like you know how the mirror or the angle of the mirror which is so something that it's so important for the periscope to actually work right um to see it reflected to see how you know that diagonal or that slope gets you know amplified somewhere else within the project that gives you some guidelines right or tools in in its transformation into architectural objects mm -hmm. um so yeah, so that would be my first comment. And then of course, like um, it would be to also have like more clarity in, in terms of, you know, uh, how certain drawings um, are consistent between one and the other, right? Mm -hmm. um, to help us, for example, like in one of the views, especially with the guy over the kayak, there is a glimpse of, you know, structural details of how those tessellated uh, surfaces are, you know, uh, been built, right? Like we mm -hmm. notice some members, maybe those members are, uh, you know, um, made out of um, steel bars, I don't know, aluminum, I don't know. But, uh, but then when we see your section, which is your section perspective that actually reveals so much about the project, like the structure only appears as, you know, some, um, some studs or pilotes that are embedded into, you know, um, the water. So, I mean, I, I would like for you to, you know, um, reveal more about like what it takes tectonically to transform your ideas, your concepts into, you know, material architectural um, uh, objects. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I I really appreciate, um, I don't know, Lindsay, if you've ever been to a, a project that utilizes the technology of a periscope. Um, there's a, a former professor at the University of Arizona who actually um, did not take his project to the, uh, to the level that you're obviously trying to take to the project. But he actually had terrible views from his home, and so he built a periscope and the reflection of the periscope became a wall of uh, a wall just reflected the mountains. I think it was the Tucson mountains. And it became um, very similar to having like a Grusian ribbon window in your home, except it was uh, using periscope technology. Um, one of the things that really, one of the potentials that really interests me with your project is the fact that I'm trying to understand the relation between people um, moving in space, um, the kayaking, the walking, um, there's even the theater uh, dance element and how that sort of coincides, how that parallels utilizing uh, reflections because in a lot of these instances, especially I'm looking at the um, bottom right image, which is on the large um, theater steps. Um, how people moving and you know how people moving in space and how that could be uh, engaging on another level because if you think about it um, just even the middle image on the bottom you have uh, water shown but water in itself is a mirror at times and it can be a, a mirror that's um, as you're showing it kind of rippled and it distorts imagery it can be very smooth and can be like glass and I'm just curious how this uh, and that's obviously not a technology that's just uh, you know, a substance, but 
I'm curious to see if you started to think about how um, the surfaces on the ground plane also affect the surfaces that you're trying to re um, that are being reflected, and how someone moving and uh, and that reflection also affects your project. Did you consider, uh, you know, there's an LMA project in um, Portugal, and the floors are basically uh, stainless steel. And uh, I believe they're milled finished stainless steel, but they're semi-reflective. They still distort the uh, images of people walking, and they get dusty and all those things. That, that happens to floors. And, and so could you speak to that at all, or if that's something that um, piqued your curiosity during the project? Yeah, um, that was a big, a big driver in terms of, um, like my building's not temporary in the fact that it's not like an inflatable like tent that you can move around, but mm -hmm. the idea that what you see in the building is constantly changing um, because like people aren't staying still, the, the lighting's different, the, the water moving is different. Um, like if I, if I had the technical abilities, I would like to do it more, more animations to, to try to get that effect in my, my representation about how like, um, like just kind of like that, that animated GIF with the, the people moving is the, the, the shadows that are created are based on, based on the people, but it's, it's not an exact representation. It's one that's been distorted in a certain way. It can you tell me, for instance, uh, in your diagram, the sectional that's on the, uh, the bottom left, uh, mm -hmm. you've highlighted uh, basically um, a person who's standing at the top of your um, large, I'm going to just call it an amphitheater space, this large seating area. And then the other side, there's someone who's in a canoe that's presumably uh, also able to see that person. Is that correct? I'm just trying to understand the red zone that you delineated. Yeah. Um, so the idea that is it's double sided, so they can they can both see each other. So that image on the bottom middle is um, that kayaker and they, they they're looking up and they see the the person on the stage, the guitarist, and then also the person on the the top, the person that showed um, in red on the section. So it's it's like that um, that first concept image where the person on the bottom is seeing the, the taller person's eyes reflected on the other side, and then presumably the other person can also look down and see the, the shorter person's eyes as well. So the idea that the scope is not just providing one person with the view, but it, it's like that double-sided connection. It seems like one of, I'm, I am familiar with the Funhouse project, but I'm not into, you know, I'm not um, an expert on it by any means, but um, for you, what is the relationship between, um, you know, making an instrument uh, for uh, an experiential purpose, right? Um, and then feeling like you're in an instrument versus making a, a piece of architecture that is uh, for the human body. It seems like, uh, sure, all the projects have to deal with that in some way, but it seems like it's a very, like there, should, there is some tension between that where you feel like at once you don't really belong here and it's sort of a, you know, lighthearted um, kind of experience. And at the same time, there are things like steps and stages and you have seating and chairs. And I'm just curious about uh, at least maybe you can just educate me on the on the way the funhouse um, that kind of that sort of tension between the notion that you're you are supposed to be in the space people are and then the fact that maybe you're just sort of, you've happened upon this really <laughs> strange instrument of reflection and um, and how you know in a way I'm wondering how a person feels do they feel like this is a uh, the welcoming space, some of the spaces you hang out in, and some of the spaces you sort of just are transient, you just move through them. And how did you feel about the project? Or make, take a moment to educate me about the, the fun house. Mm -hmm. um, really, like I know with the fun palace, they were trying not to define anything like, too much. Um, like there were programmatic spaces at different scales, but um, like you could use them for different things. So I was, I was trying to create like spaces where things could happen without necessarily being like, yes, this is exactly what's going to happen. Um, so like trying not to define people's, people's movement or what they do too much. Because um, I know like I, I intend for like the, 
the shadow yeah. theater to be like a dance hall, but it doesn't necessarily have to be used for that. It's really just a big open space where multiple multiple activities could take place in theory. Audio is coming and going. Am I? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Sorry about that. You may see my face disappear, reappear. I'm not sure, but um, there's a slight delay, but it's not affecting the audio. I don't think it seems that it's it's not an issue. But I think you've raised a really good uh, question, Matt, about the relationship to what the fun palace intentions were. And I think that Lindsay has really been adherent to the sort of user, user uh, control of what the program mm -hmm. might be. It's been fairly open-ended in that sense. And I think that that's commendable for you, Lindsay, in the, in the way that you've maybe prescribed some sort of a uh, phenomena to happen when people come in, but at the same time, it's not so programmatic specific that it's limiting it to one, one act or thing. And so I, I do like that about your project. And to, to go back to your um, question, Perjana, I think is right that we sometimes as designers sort of move on something and forget what that explanation of its, its, uh, maybe diagram might be like, you know, like what, how does the periscope actually work? You can forget that someone coming at this with fresh eyes, like doesn't yeah. know these things. No, and no, sure. Yeah. But, but it was more than, you know, like how it works in the, in the project in the sense, like how does the diagram of the periscope then, you know, um, allows for the project to become the way it has, you know, been formed. Right. 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 Like, for example, like, is the 45 degree angle something that gets repeat, repeated somewhere else because it, it affords you to create, you know, certain partitions that otherwise you wouldn't, you would have not thought of, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. mostly what, what I meant with that. Right. And I think to, to Lindsay's defense, unfortunately, a lot of her early study models on the sort of mm -hmm. spatial uh, connections and juxtapositions and, and really beautiful abstract studies of what the periscope does as it translates into architecture and space are are still sitting on her desk in some oh, no. <laughs> and so this was one in particular that I really appreciated its initial studies that for uh, unfortunately couldn't be a part of this presentation um, yeah there there was also something uh, if I have time to add something else um mm -hmm. i think that um i was in in your review lindsay uh, when you presented the the periscope or uh, a one-to-one right. artifact and uh, to be honest like that was one of my my favorite objects that day uh, because there was something about you know putting yourself in you know in the shoes of others and and trying to be able to see things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to see because of this prosthetic device right uh, and looking at your project right now, I keep, you know, wondering what is the speculation behind that, right? Like if you were to, you know, think about your project or like the potentials of that object a, a few months ago, uh, was it precisely that, right? Like that if, if I, being the short person that I am, right, I could be able to see uh, a little bit uh, taller than, you know, what I'm normally able to see, right? Um, so I'm just curious about like, you know, whether, um, uh, I mean, in what ways you could reinforce that idea or bring that idea forward and, and push it into, you know, this new project. And I keep thinking about our relationship with nature, right? And our relationship with water, right? Like um, in, in this project right now, in the way in the stage it is, right? We're looking, humans are looking at humans, right? Like the canoe guy and then us in the stage or vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm curious to know, like, if maybe, you know, you could have inverted the relationship, like not looking at the surface of the water, but actually under the water, right? Like to actually understand, like, you know, uh, the presence of this body of, you know, maybe uh, different species that might inhabit that, or just, you know, this constant, you know, um, 
organic flow of water that it's constantly being there that we only notice or or you know uh, from the surface level right um so you know mm -hmm. like in that way you could actually you know bring something from that initial speculation that that i think like could also bring something new to the discussion of you know what you know speculation for architecture could mean uh which i thought like it was very you know a very excellent in that you know object one to one object um, that you I don't remember your your classmates but 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 I was super excited to see right um, so maybe that is also something that could be interesting for you as a designer to maybe explore even further not only in this project but maybe as you advance in your in your education right to understand like the potential of architecture to to break like those dichotomies just by maybe framing them maybe by reintroducing them in unconventional ways right like typically when we think about nature in our projects right like it's just like garden bed where we plant a tree if we're lucky right uh, but in your in your in your case you're actually able to you know submerge us into this body of water, which could be very interesting. Technically, I wouldn't know how that, you know, periscope might work. Like if you can actually look below instead of, you know, above, I wouldn't know, to be honest. Uh, but, you know, that, that could be interesting, right? Like, uh, again, you, you have, you know, this is the perfect studio to do that, right? <laughs> to speculate on what it means to bring, you know, an other, um, entity into the conversation of what architecture is for is it architecture only for humans or you know are an expansion of our way of you know experiencing our human lives but also attached and you know in some in in a symbiotic way with other forms of life as well mm -hmm. which could be very interesting i mean please keep going with that research i would encourage you to actually push it uh, even further mm -hmm. I, I think one of the uh, just one thing if I could add to, yes. to what you're saying is that I think it is uh, what makes the periscope, which is an, an analog um, device, um, interesting is that at least in this project that there is the idea that you can engage and then affect the other side of things um, because, you know, um, if not, then it becomes a video camera that's submerged into the water and you're just watching a, a screen. So I think the idea that you can engage with, whether it's another person or maybe it is a way of engaging with nature that's, um, that has an effect. I think that's the playfulness that you can actually stand on one end and, um, uh, you know, wave to another person or something. I, I think there's something interesting about that. I'm just trying to think of a way that you could apply it to nature so that it still has that sort of um, back and forth communication uh, as opposed to visualizing um, you know a uh, just becoming a view scope yeah well yeah. i think that no. what's what's mm -hmm. what's super interesting to me is that as lindsay progresses um to actually heighten the tension between accessing the instrument uh, versus so I, I think what one of the things you're getting at is that you could actually have these instruments above ground and never be able to explore the space below physically. And I think that could also be another direction and that there, the, the tension is so great and it's so important that the periscope is part of the project that it becomes crucial to experiencing the spaces you're creating. I think that could be another direction as well. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that um, you guys are talking about that because pretty early on in the design process, I was, um, kind of playing with the idea of is it about looking at people or is it about looking at nature especially since it is in a park and there is a lot of nice greenery and I, I i just i made that kind of decision that it was more about people than the nature um because at first i was trying to see how i'll make maybe do both but to me i i just thought that people were more interesting <laughs> i'd rather look at people than than plants <laughs> No, of course, but but actually, what what would be extremely interesting to also note about that is like you know this analog instrument that it's looking at an artificial man-made nature, right? Like the Colorado River right now, like has been intervened in so many ways by us to remain the way it is, right? And also the park that you're alluding to has been curated and manicured in a way that you know 
in a in an essence like when we look at nature we're looking at us <laughs> which is mm -hmm. you know one of those like interesting reflections that your project could be you know alluding to or you know reflecting upon well i appreciate how uh discussion and and opportunities the project has brought up for for us today lindsay and that you should as suggested continue to do this research into what the the theories of projection mean for your work in the future um i think we should move on but thank you thank you for going first i know that's that's not always easy to do especially in this format um so uh, Dennis, I believe you're next. Are you ready to share your screen? Uh, I should probably stop sharing mine. <laughs> yeah. And Dennis, I think you need to turn off your mute. Oh, no, you are. You're not muted. Yeah. I can't hear you, though. We can't hear you. It says oh, you're. Okay. Yes. It's working. Yes. Okay, perfect. Can you share your screen with us now? Mm -hmm. Or... Okay, it should be up there. Um, give me one second. I can't see something I need. If you want me to uh, show your presentation, I can do that. No, it's okay. I fixed it. Okay. okay. Um, my name is Dennis Pishkinsoy. Uh, my main word was orbiting. Can we see and, your screen, Dennis? Oh, it's not sharing right now. Sorry about that. It's back up. Um, and then my word was orbiting, and I have a GIF on the front page. Uh, looking at assignment two, my group created this apparatus that could allow you to listen to things better, and it has different modes depending on which way the funnels are facing. Um, and there's also a speaking mode. Someone uh, trying to say something, sorry. I'm getting like some feedback. Just okay, keep going. Um, uh, speaking mode, a concise listening mode where the funnels would be positioned towards your ears as if someone were either whispering on either side and then attentive listening mode, which is where you're kind of amplifying all the sounds by having the funnels facing outwards. So what I really drew from this assignment is the idea of projection um and kind of directing your view towards a certain area uh, looking at the sites i drew from the a lot of circles around the park area uh, and i just want to have a continuation of like the flowing paths and going around looking at the views this is the project it consists of three separate domes um, i wanted to be playful with the materiality. So I have a geodesic dome that's covered in a tarp, uh, an inflatable dome, that's the cafe in the center. And on the right is made out of concrete. Um, the path that winds around can is just like accessed from two either side. So once you're on the path, you get to see the entirety of the project. Um, and there's an allusion to the sun, the moon and the earth. Cause I think uh, on a really public site, I want it to be um, public space as much as possible. So that's why you can access everything. Um, that's why the geodesic dome is kind of an open air theater. Here's the plan for the three. Um, my plan for the theater, the 360 theater, is to have uh, projections coming from the top 
So there's different lights and you could do live performances in there, or you could just have a show that's strictly from the visual perspective um, using the projectors. Um, on the concrete side, I have a planetarium and that's a little bit of the opposite uh, thing of projection. Instead of projecting everything towards the center, it starts from the middle and projects outwards. Uh, and then I also have the cafe, which is on the second floor, but you can enter from the first floor and go up a spiral staircase to get to the top. Looking at the section, um, you can see my planetarium is on an incline rather than having everyone sit in a circle and look up. Uh, I did this because it provides a more unique experience, I would say, because you have like once you go into the planetarium from the bottom floor, you have to go on a spiral upwards inside of the dome to get to your actual seat. Um, and then on the other side in the 360 theater, I also have that split into two. This would be just a standing area um, as public as possible. And then the cutout I have on the 360 theater would be to allow different experiences throughout the day. And you'll see on a certain perspective that I have how that is. These are some of the views. And this is the one I was talking about where at different times of the day, you would have a uh, lighting condition change inside of that space. Um, and then an example of the rendering of a projection show on the bottom right. Any questions? Okay. Thank Sorry, you, I thought you were just gonna keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, mm, this is getting somewhere. Um, so then it's maybe if it's okay, um, can you tell us um, or reflect a little bit upon uh, what do you think your project spe speculates on? Um, it's mostly the way of these like interaction of three very different spaces, I would say. Uh, and how kind of you could take just spherical, like three very simple geometric figures, but arrange them in such a way that you kind of have this, like you have choice in which experience you go to. Like each, I don't know, I think each of the spaces I designed has multiple ways of experiencing the same thing. And then of course, whichever one you're at, you can have a different relationship to the whole project. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, that definitely answers my question. Like you're speculating on how, you know, simple geometries or, you know, simple um, elements in space can interact and produce mm -hmm. Uh, very distinct experiences, uh, even though they belong to the same, you know, uh, family. Of I forms. guess the most innovative part would be my like projection theater, having it be more visual based rather than always having like a live show for a theater space. Yeah, yeah, no, I, and I agree that like even your renderings of that one space, actually, it's it's very interesting, and it definitely you know uh, is saying a lot uh, on its own. Uh, but, you know, for your interest uh, regarding the interaction of these elements or, you know, like the presence of choice between someone meandering through the pathways that you have created, whether I enter this one or the other, I think like there is a lot of potential in, in exploring what it means uh, that point of contact or that pinching point between, you know, one path uh, with the other or maybe if you know if you could in a in a different iteration of the project maybe also consider in what ways um, these elements these domes could actually touch one another, what would that mean in terms of you know geometry, but also what it would mean in terms of experience, right? Because like if you imagine the planetarium like this dark um, space when it touches maybe the dome that has like display of light. What would that mean for someone that goes from, you know, 
a completely dark space to some uh, another space that there is like a, con a con constant presence of light and different actually temperatures of light as well, right? Um, so, you know, I, I thought that um, when I saw the domes, I, I, I was hoping to see like actually um, how that was uh, solved. So when I saw then the plans, I was like, oh, then they only connect through this uh, series of elevated pathways. So I'm just curious then that, you know, the biggest interaction happens in those pathways, right? And they don't seem to, you know, denote any sort of, you know, importance or hierarchy in the way in which, you know, uh, one dome interacts with the other. So I'm just curious about like, you know, that's why I asked you the question, then what are you speculating on, right? Because it is about interaction of the experiences between in each one of these domes, they actually never interact. They're just, you know, like circumvented by the series of pathways, uh, which, you know, could be interesting if the speculation was a different concept, right? Uh, maybe it is, you know, more about the relationship of the domes with the city. Maybe it has to do more with, you know, um, consolidating different, you know, visual experiences that have to deal more with, you know, uh, a presence or absence of light, right? So it, that's why, you know, maybe, um, the diameter of one dome uh, uh, has like uh, some sort of relationship to that. Like imagine like the dome of the, the Pantheon in Rome, right? Like light changes constantly uh, depending on, you know, the presence of the sun, right? Or like the, the presence of the sun in its pathway uh, through the sky, right? Um, so, and that compared to the other dome that has a, a presence of artificial light always changing the way we read that space could be interesting, right? Like, but if it has something to do with, you know, even their geometry and their interaction between one another, right? So for example, like, yes, the cafe is also within uh, one of these domes, but maybe there, there is also an opportunity in that particular one in which there is a different light condition, that there is like a, a different mechanism by which it stands alone or is distinct, that it's not just based on, on program possibly. Yeah, I would, um, I, I would actually agree with that quite a lot. Um, um, something else that I think is interesting is that the Earth Cafe, for instance, you're very aware that you're in a sphere because of the section and you look down and you see that it's physically the building is the bottom of a sphere. And I think that um, there's something about that, um, again, that sort of relationship between the you know, person and then their uh, understanding of the space that they're in. Because at the uh, theater or the planetarium, for instance, uh, you're only aware of that dome because of the uh, the side, you know, the part that's above grade, basically. So the size, the, the top that's domed. And then um, also in the 360 theater, you've sliced away at it, you've added a floor um, into it. And so there's actually even less awareness that you're in this sort of um, spherical space. And I think that there's there's something, I know that a lot of this has to do with intuition, but there's something that's interesting about that. And, um, and you know, having the visitor, the, or the, the person utilizing the space, uh, having that awareness, because clearly from the outside, I think you can understand these as being, uh, you know, it's like Boulay's project from, I don't remember what year that was, but a very long time ago, um, there was a kind of above grade, it had steps going up to it, but I guess the question becomes, uh, you're alluding that these are spheres that can, are continuous underground. And it would be interesting to see if you were to, um, you know, especially this yellow theater space that's on the top right, if there was a way of sort of recognizing that and it being something that's actually more, you know, you're heightening the experience even more by coming into that space and seeing that it in fact is a sphere that goes in the ground and perhaps you go down into it. But um, so it's something I really uh, appreciate, about, appreciate about the Earth Cafe. How did the, the ground datum play into your, uh, uh, in your diagrams, in your sections, the, the datum is like a knife that slices the spheres off and experience doesn't really happen under that blade. And I'm just curious how you utilize the ground or how you perceive the ground in this project. Uh, yeah, I would say the cafe is the most element that I'm playing with that the most <clears throat> because the bottom half, I just have an opening cut out kind of like a spaceship almost. You would go into that 
and that you just experience the bottom separately, there would be a staircase that goes up. And that's the green in the middle that you see, the staircase that goes up to the actual cafe floor. Mm -hmm. It is this. Um, it is an interesting experience because uh, one of these objects is actually a sphere and the other two are actually domes uh, to a degree. I think there's sort of like, it's questionable. And, um, and I don't want to get too much into like form making and those sorts of things, but I, I like to think that there would be some sort of recognition of that because again, from the outside of the project, as you're walking up to it or arriving, it certainly appears that there are three spheres that are dug into the ground. And once you arrive in these spaces, there really is only one sphere that you become aware of. And, uh, and I, I kind of feel like that's something that's significant to your project is that understanding of the ground plane and, and is it kind of like what you see is not what you get, what you see is what you get kind of, uh, kind of thing. But I, I also, um, and I think that's something that as you move forward, you can consider experientially because I think that, um, that seeing kind of a more conventional floor system in the theater space is not quite as intriguing as what you have in the cafe or even what you have in the planetarium with a dome that sort of surrounds your entire um, basically hemisphere in the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, think was... I know, uh, Dennis, you, you had some serious computer issues at one point after the break, but I, I wished that all along you could have developed each of your directions a lot further so that you could then have your position a bit more clearly uh, developed and stated and visualized. Because I do think you are doing some interesting things, but the points that are being brought up are, are very um, important ones to the broad idea that you have in working with spheres and domes. I think that particularly the point that uh, Matt's brought up about um, the datum that exists amongst the three more similar than different geometries that you're working with. Um, and I, I think that Perjana has also brought up a, an important factor about the relationship of the three collectively, how they operate together. And that's something that I've, I've struggled to get from you because it was first two and then it was sort of two, but they were very different. And then there were suddenly three. And, and I think controlling that is, is important for a strategy and moving forward and having a process that has a certain logic to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, once I got that there were three, I definitely want to explore them as much as possible. But uh, just saying, mentioning what Matt was saying, it definitely was my intention to appear as if there were three spheres that were dug into the ground. And I would have liked to play with that more. Well, well my only point was that I think that's a fine uh, position to take on your project. The, the question is, how does that reverberate for the people that actually pass through the, the boundary of the sphere into the interior space? Mm -hmm. And um, because they will arrive assuming that these are spheres because one of them floats. You kind of cued them into saying, all these are spheres and here's the bottom of one, in fact. And so I think you have to think about just what the expectation is and how you can really take your position and, and take it even further with that knowledge that you've sort of set them up with this expectation. So I think it's interesting on that level. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to that point, like we, we can also speak about like the very positive uh, aspects of what you actually made. And, and I cannot stop mm -hmm. but looking at the, the renderings of the 360 theater, which, you know, reminds me of James Thorell and, you know, like these ideas of, you know, landscape art and how it relates to, you know, um, you know, uh, ideas of the sublime as, a, as an aesthetic category that it's different than beauty. And, you know, like it, it, it actually, you know, makes sense that then you, you know, chose a dome or you chose the sphere because if actually, if you would like to draw upon the history of domes and um, spheres in the context of architectural history, right? It is always about a, a sort of aesthetic experience that exalts something that is bigger than us. So it's never about the human scale, but always through a scale that it's, that, you know, escapes our understanding, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, so I think like, you know, maybe 
if you were to then um, discover or speculate even further about like these geometries and their impact in the, you know, in the history of architectural experiences, right? It could be interesting to, you know, tie your project to that genealogy, right? Um, to tie it to, you know, these ideas of representation of order, like, you know, and that's why, you know, the planetarium makes sense, right? <laughs> and, you know, mm. your ideas of connecting this to the earth, to the sun and to the moon, right? In, in something that is not just uh, metaphorical, but that, that implies a sort of reflection on the ordering systems that regulate and actually, you know, organize architectural knowledge, right? Um, so that's why, you know, like maybe, you know, a, a bigger um, understanding of, you know, what a diameter means, right? In terms of acoustics or in terms of, you know, the presence or absence of light, as I was mentioning before, could be very, very interesting for you. Like if you would like, as you progress in your education, to pursue that line of thought, right? In what ways everything you do from now on also relates to the history of form, right? Yeah. That I, would, I would tell you, I've been lucky enough to work with James Trail on the sky space and he would absolutely love if he actually had a dome <laughs> to work with. He usually gets boxes. And, and surprisingly, um, some of the things that he thinks about, which it will sound very mundane to you on your project is, well, how do I deal with entering into the space to make it feel like you're in a pure sphere? Um, and so that becomes something like, how does the door work? Can you see it? How do you have a fold in the in the space to enter and exit? And so those are things that your project would certainly need to address as it develops down the road. But I would say, I would agree completely with everything um, Piergiana said is, is that it's, uh, it really does harken back to some of these like very powerful and um, early um, ideas of what architecture should and could be. And so I think the, to be aware of those and to really let that, um, those be embedded in your work, be able to refer to them would be really uh, excellent for your project. Mm -hmm. Those are fantastic suggestions. Um, yeah, and I think we points. should move on. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah. It's my pleasure. Yeah. So Sterling, I think you're up next. Is that correct? I believe I am. Here, Good. let me go see if I can share. Okay. One second. Finding the button. Oh, there it is. All right. What do you guys see? Do you guys see PowerPoint right now? Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. So we're gonna go ahead and get this started. All right, you guys see full screen, no weird yeah, windows on the side. Them. All right, yep. perfect. So that good. means everything's working just fine. All right, so uh, my name is Sterling Harris, uh, and my project is uh, called the Urban Crawler. It's actually been quite characterized, and you'll see soon. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, before we actually move into the Urban Crawler, I wanted to frame a bit of the context around how I got here. Um, our uh, professor talked about uh, project two, the uh, one-to-one -one apparatus that we created and one that we collaborated with with Maggie, which she'll talk about later uh, during her presentation um, was an apparatus in the a console that people could get in the harnesses and tie themselves to and their movements and what their actions would be recorded on a base in the center. Um, and that actually became a uh, very real. This is the little console thing in the center. And this is us uh, kind of unraveling all the ropes while people in the background are putting on their harnesses. And this is like the whole thing in action. Unfortunately, during the day we did lose the marker so we weren't able to record anything, but. It still does, you know, work very well um, in connecting people to it. And the main theme behind it was uh, finding some sort of comfort that you can uh, attach to people that they wouldn't be able to find without another person. So specifically in this photo, the two people sitting on the benches uh, wouldn't be able to recline or lean back without the other person across uh, the courtyard. So it's kind of a social connection was the main theme of this project. Uh, Moving into project three, we started off with the concept and mine was a, actually a geodesic dome that you could project stuff on and had project stuff off of. And a huge criticism of it was that it was um, too realistic. It was uh, not really speculative. It's kind of been done before. 
Uh, and it took me a few minutes to actually get that drilled into my head. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I'm, this is speculative studio. So I started to get a little bit more creative after that. And finally, before we get into the crawler, uh, we started off with a precedent study, which ended up being uh, the one I chose was an entry for the fairy tales competition. And this is a giant moving apparatus that creates gas and releases it into the air. Uh, at least that's the interpretation I got from the entry. And with that, I ended up creating a giant moving apparatus that releases bubbles into the air. Um, and this is my project. This is the crawler. Um, this is actually the first drawing I made. And looking at it, it's actually in portrait. So we're going to have to deal with a little bit of zooming, but I hope that's fine. Uh, if you look at some of the elements that take place in here, it's a uh, actually, a lot of the circulation around this structure is exterior to interior, and you have to, a lot of these places you can only get to by air travel. So what I mean by it creates bubbles is it creates bubbles as vessels to uh, pick up people. Like people can be passengers within some of the bubbles that are floating around this drawing. And where that's, uh, where they, uh, one huge point of entry and exit in the structure is in the belly right now. And this is kind of explaining uh, perhaps how some of the bubbles can arrive and depart with or without passengers and then float off and go wherever they want to go. Um, this is going to, if you're seeing what I'm seeing, this is kind of taking you through the drawing, showing you a little bit some of the details and stuff that's going on. I'll just let it play for a second. It only lasts about like 15 seconds. All right, and then I'll go ahead and uh, indicate some of my suggestions or uh, of what program happens in each space. So some of them are suggestions, some of them are perhaps more of a demand based on what the space is. Uh, and then let's go ahead and let's see. This red line right here actually is an indication of how I'm gonna cut the next drawing. The next drawing is a plan, but I wanted to show this for context before. Uh, so it's not assumed that the plan is cut flat because cutting it flat would make a really weird actually plan for this one. So this is a, a kind of it showing a top down plan view of the central space being cut through uh, with the left showing the, the theater, the center showing a giant congregation space. Uh, and also I, um, it's got some storage above. So what you're looking at now is perhaps this in a uh, setting up configuration and transportation configuration. So you won't see any people. It's mostly just for utility and getting to a site. Um, and then on the, in the back in the right and left rooms, well, for us, it would be top and bottom. I have a couple of uh, labyrinths, which I imagine not only would be fun to actually be inside of, but it's also fun to look at in plan. And yes, you can get through, all, you can get through them. Uh, let's see. The next drawing I have is an interior experience uh, inside of that dome. And what's going on right now is uh, a performance uh, where people are, well, you have performers who are suspended in air, uh, all connected to a central uh, performer who's actually on a bed. And members of the audience are also connected to that central performer on the bed. And I know a bed sounds kind of weird to have in here, but I did pull this performance from a Cirque du Soleil performance. And if you're seeing what I'm seeing, it's actually an image of the stage of what's going on. Um, I thought it'd be really cool to pull that. And I thought it was relevant to what I had done in project two with people being physically harnessed and connected to something happening or many things happening. And uh, with that, I believe that's mostly it. Uh, a little side note uh, or bloopers at the end. I did make many drawings and attempts to get here. Uh, this one is a little indescriptive. This was going to be an attempt at starting that echo chamber, which actually I should explain. You see the giant circular space towards the back top. I was going to, that's actually a, like a whole resonance chamber where you could walk in on a platform and be in the center of a giant sphere. And I imagine the, the sound that could come from that would be really interesting. But uh, I ended up focusing more on other aspects that needed more attention of my project. 
getting into program, uh, it was really hard to, I, at least I struggled with finding um, a good way of representing my program. And I ended up integrating it into the section. And this is just a couple examples of me trying something that perhaps wasn't really working. Uh, another drawing I started was a, an interior perspective that I'd actually spent a lot of time on, but the more and more I worked on it, the less and less I was showing. It became less clear what was happening and what I was supposed to be showing in here. So I ended up doing a full 180 and making another interior shot, which I think shows a lot more and actually has an experience to feel when you look at it. And the last one was uh, when I tried to dip into computer modeling of this and uh, I figured I, uh, time would be better spent working on that interior view, uh, creating something. So this never got that far. And with that, I believe that is it. And I have the slide here just so we can see some of those views. So maybe I'm just gonna jump into this if it's okay with you, Matt. Oh, or if you want to start. Mm -hmm. uh, please go. My uh, video is frozen. I don't actually set this still very often. <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> okay. Oh, so uh, thank you, Sterling, for your presentation. And uh, well, really for taking like the challenge to be exposed and, you know, uh, show us your, your project and, you know, uh, even you know noticing the value of presenting you know failed ideas I, I i don't think we see that often and actually you know i i, I really truly appreciate it that you you know brought like th the drawings that could have been but are that were not <laughs> um so i i think like there's a lot of value in that we we typically don't think about like the many many ideas architectural ideas from competitions to you know, this sort of um, uh, more speculative projects that then, you know, just end up having their place in a drawer. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. So I just wanted to start by commending you on that. Um, especially since we live in this world in which, you know, everything needs to be perfect, everything needs to be pristine in order for it to, you know, have some sort of value. So I, I, I do appreciate this um, a lot. Um, but then, I just want to talk about the project itself and, you know, what it is that it's doing. What do you think it is doing? Uh, because, you know, I, I can read a lot into it, right? Like I can read about, you know, um, ideas of, of otherness and, you know, the normal and the abnormal and, you know, what it is to, you know, uh, be among people that, that, you know, would enjoy living life inside a bubble that gets you to a place where you continue to be inside that bubble. Uh, so, you know, there are many ways in which I could read the project, uh, but I would love to get more from you. Like, um, is this a, a critique of a contemporary condition? Is this, you know, like a continuation of a sort of, you know, utopian thought uh, within the discipline of architecture? Uh, what is it that you want to say with this project, right? Because inevitably, not only does your project uh, relates with the reference that you presented at the beginning, but also it relates to the, you know, similar um, paper architecture that has to do more with uh, the possibility of a project being just a statement, you know, a sort of manifesto of what like the vision of a particular thinker is and it's, you know, uh, materialization in, you know, in, in, in architectural form. So I'm just curious to know more about that. Like, what are your thoughts on what you've done? And what is it exactly that you think your project is doing? Um, my project is actually has a really personal motivation more than it is um, something that's external, it's more internal. And it's um, more of a critique of how uh, conventional or how I stick to conventional things. Uh, I'm don't think it would be too, uh, I don't want to be too self-centered and say I'm too pragmatic, but I do think everything I've done in the past has been somewhat realistic, or at least I tried to attain that. And this is more of a, a, a break away from that. I'm trying to be as, for lack of a better word, 
um, make ridiculous ideas happen. Um, and that's why I chose to have something walk on very skinny legs, something so huge, bubbles that could actually support the weight of 30 people. Um, people falling 50 feet into the river, um, things like that. So I'm trying to pack as many of my crazy ideas into something that could look like it could at least work in my imagination. That's kind of right, the so, whole idea. So let's say that your project is a sort of exorcism of your crazy ideas, all packed into one crazy drawing. However, I would say that, you know, some sort of pragmatism still exists in the project, right? Like um, in, in the end, you are thinking as an architect or as a designer, trying to materialize crazy ideas and their possible interpretation in the real world. In the end, you know, the most iconic drawing or the two most iconic drawings of your project are a section and a plan, you know, like the most conventional and pragmatic drawings that an architect can produce ever, right? Um, and actually, like, um, if you if you regard the history of representation or read, you know, Robin Evans in the projective cast, uh, which is, you know, like an amazing book on the history of architectural representation and on the history of projection, for that matter, uh, you know, a section always reveals the truth, right? Um, whether it is, you know, a section, um, a vertical section or, you know, a plan section, which is always the views that we never ever experience as human beings, right? It's only a, a project of our imagination and only architects have the capacity to think in that way and create that sort of, you know, revelation. Um, so, that's why you know I'm trying to ask you, and you know, to maybe, uh, maybe not today, or and maybe not tomorrow, because you might be tired, and you know, you just want to get it over with, and you know, continue to your next studio. But maybe to reflect on these ideas, right? Um, what it means to actually produce a drawing. Uh, what what does it actually means to materialize an idea, whether it is through a drawing, through a model, or through something, uh, uh, so through something else. Um, because I think like, you know, a project doesn't necessarily have to be pragmatic. I, I totally disagree with that. Um, I, I do believe that, you know, like in paper architecture and the value of presenting ideas, uh, whether, you know, they're feasible or not, right? Um, because they, they are also able to, you know, um, maybe with what, you know, you think you're doing, uh, maybe we can read other things into it right and project ourselves into ways that we could have not imagined ourselves projecting us in doing right so the echo chamber right like um the the bubbles like for me i can read so much of the contemporary political climate but you know i don't know if that's what your ideas were or what you're basing your ideas on uh but you know like that's me reading into this and understanding like oh you know Maybe he's trying to say this, maybe he isn't, but you know, like maybe if you were to think more rigorously about, you know, what those ideas are representing, right? Uh, rather than, you know, um, thinking about it in, in, you know, whether the, this technology exists or not, whether it is possible to actually travel inside bubbles, right? Uh, um, so maybe it could be interesting to understand like the work of more conceptual architects, right? Like. Uh, from, you know, the, the radical architecture of the 60s, all the way to, you know, um, the, the 80s with the work of, you know, Diller Scofidio, or even like the very, very initial work of um, uh, Kub Himmenblau, right, In which they had spheres um, that had to deal with technology and, and, you know, bubbles of information and what it means to live inside a bubble, right? Um, so anyways, I would, you know, encourage you to expand on that, right? And, you know, find value in the sort of, you know, uh, power representation for architectural thought and what it means today um, to produce this sort of, you know, practice. Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually would say that you can, uh utilize a project like this to make um, a statement. It can be very much about the zeitgeist. I think, um, I think the, your imagination, the spaces that you're creating, the way that it, um, you know, it's, it's a real delightful project. 
to be able to see and to, um, to study and understand. But I do think that um, you can either uh, make a statement um, that is uh, less pragmatic in nature, but it, and it doesn't necessarily um, solve problems. It, it makes us think about our state of being or our time um, in 2020. Um, or there's the possibility of doing architecture uh, very much like this that can, um, that can create solutions. And, and for me, obviously there are references to um, the thoughts and theories of Arkansas. Um, but I also think a little bit about the, um, some of the earlier Livius Woods projects where he would do pro you know, houses for experiencing earthquakes that were, you know, in these fissures in the ground. But I think uh, because he just poses a very simple question, like why, why do earthquakes need to be frightening? Why can't they be enjoyable and fun? And so I see some of that in your work here, and it just makes me ponder, like, what are you trying to expose an issue, or are you trying to pose a solution to a perceived problem? Um, and so when I, again, I think about, you know, writing in bubbles, and and in a way, the antithesis of that is this sort of Cirque du Soleil scene that you created. Um, I think it's, I think these are all profound questions and i i do think that at some point it's important to give us some direction on what your your understanding of your project is why it's significant in that way and maybe it's not right now but but i think to take this to the next level it, it should start to speak to our time because if not it's a bit of a retro project which may it does not take away from the delight of the project in any way but it doesn't necessarily have that really um, hard-hitting um, necessity to the lot uh, that a lot of these other projects that have been mentioned to you really have. So um, I think it's a, a really, um, I think it's really successful in those other ways. I just think that it's maybe just missing that one element. Okay. Yeah, I would. I, I mean, would what agree. What are your with, thoughts on that? Can you yeah. comment, uh, Sterling, quickly, and then I think we need to move on for the last project. Um, yeah, I do think that uh, that's something I'm uh, missing. It's more of a, I could have perhaps better, what's the way to phrase this? I'm sorry, I had a little trouble. Uh, maybe made it more clear what I'm trying to actually uh, say, um, even if it is something that's very internalized, um, because there are an infinite amount of ways to read this. But if um, there is something I was trying to do, that should be, that's something I could have accomplished. But I do appreciate all the feedback and I'm, I'm feeling happy after today. Good, well, lots to think about then. Thank you, Sterling. Um, Emily, if you can uh, pull up your presentation, we can move on to our last one for the morning session. Hi. Hello. My screen real quick. Okay, can you see the PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so my name is Emily. Thank you for um, coming and reviewing us today to the guest reviewers and also everybody else in our studio. Um, so my project is titled Pneumatic Tubes and that's a pretty literal explanation of what it is. I, um, I first looked at this pavilion that was, um, it was sort of just like a proposal for Spain's Expo in 2020 by uh, Sogaslano. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and this structure is basically a series of cylindrical inflatable tubes that were captured um, by this aluminum or metallic frame. And what that project really wanted, what it made me want to do was occupy those cylindrical masses and 
you know, I started to speculate on what might that feel like being inside that inflated space rather than just being under them or above them. And so with this project that I wanted to create, I wanted to capture the feeling of lightness and that feeling of weightlessness that you get from a inflatable structure. So in my concept drawing, I, again, I just wanted to focus on capturing that feeling of lightness and um, showing a structure that was sort of like hovering above the ground and all of the programs that could coexist on and around that kind of space. Um, I used things like these chandeliers and um, various like hanging programs to also capture again that that like hovering feeling and um, the like user experience that that creates. And um, my program diagram for this presentation also kind of serves as a site plan because that was some work that I lost from earlier in the semester. Um, but I really use these paths of movement and the movement that was not only from people walking on the trail, but people approaching the land from the water um, and through kind of like locating those different hotspots hot that became very clear of like where my main program hotspots were gonna be. Um, and that also informed the positioning of the tubes and how they kind of were gonna stack on top of each other and um, kind of like remain open on the end so that that circulation could still be implied. This is an animation of that process of this being kind of being moved onto the site in one piece. And then each of these different masses could be rotated, lifted, and then it, at the end being fully inflated to assume their final position. And I think that that was something really important to me was this aspect of it being really temporary and being able to just be sort of inflated anywhere or the way that it acts when it's in that semi-inflated inflated state. So I think through making this animation, um, I'm hoping that you can see that it can exist in a lot of different ways and configurations. Oops. So in plan, um, again, this is pretty similar to that uh, previous drawing of the program on it, but I just wanted to capture a few locations within one of these tubes um, showing like where my cafe would be, where um, a theater could exist. And that's giving just a, a more general scale or a more general idea of the scale of this building. Um, it also kind of shows the interaction between one tube to the other and how in this specific plan cut, it shows that interaction between these two tubes in the middle, but in any other configuration, um, there can be even more interaction. And in section, I really wanted to capture the um, more technical side of this project. I used a lot of these sort of like pulley systems within this space, again, to emphasize that feeling of lightness and really just have the user feel um, as, you know, I don't want to say anti-gravity because I think that's getting into a whole other situation, but um, just as not on the ground as they would be within this space, if that makes sense. Um, one of the other things that we had kind of discussed earlier in the semester or a couple of weeks ago was what would this experience be for people walking along this space since it is a series of inflatable rings. Um, and to me that meant that, oh, it's just sort of that like bouncy house feeling of people being able to jump around from 
one location, the tube or being lifted from one location to another. And that's sort of where I created my vertical circulation is through different connections in the tube, people can be kind of lifted and lowered um, to have like that movement happen. And this is just a, a zoomed in section on the right hand side of the tube, just to show that there's a series of metal rings that keep this inflated structure rigid um, and also allows it to be as flexible as it can be. So each of the circles are air inflated and then they're attached with that metallic ring um, that keeps it in that very like rectilinear shape. These, this series of sections is a little bit more diagrammatic and it really is intended to show the like versatility of where these tubes can be. They can shift up and from side to side to create a really like diverse program. And uh, lastly, this is a interior perspective of that cen center tube. And with this, I really just wanted to capture the sort of like, playful nature and obviously versatility of program that can happen within this space. And it also captures a little bit of the transparency that happens from when you're inside of a tube, you're able to look out and observe like the other spaces. But when you're on the outside of the tube, you're not able to see inside of like what exactly is going on. Um, yeah, so I think that this really just captures a lot of different elements of this project. That's, that's it. Emily, I, um, I had a question. Uh, my video is a little... Uh, uh, it's malfunctioning a little bit, but um, in one of the in this section of the lower uh, left hand corner, uh, when I first saw it, um, I thought that when people are you know dancing or are playing on this structure, that in a way that structure itself was sort of deforming and uh, bending down, and that's you know for so you see like the John Travolta, Uma Thurman. Uh, dance going on the right that maybe just by their activity it was actually kind of modifying this these uh, balloon structures um, did you explore anything like that because there's something really uh, first of all it's a really great presentation I think that the the diagrams and the drawings are really clear but um, uh, I was just curious if you had um, explored that as an idea because having the understanding the structure as people engage with this sort of deforming um, is something that, you know, it, it's really uh, kind of makes being on a trampoline fun or being a bounce castle fun, you know, all these things it has this sort of one-to-one -one relationship where someone has an action and then there's a reaction and the people experience that reaction. I was just curious if that had been something that you looked at. Um, that actually wasn't something that I looked into a lot, but after you've made that comment, like it, it is more clear to me that, um, you know, I wish I would have a little bit sooner. Well, it's just, uh, it's just something that I think that maybe then for you, it's the next, um, the next, you know, phase of the project. But I, I, I just, again, I think it's such a, um, it's such an interesting, uh, idea and so I can see that you know in a way this reminds me of how the uh, Statue of Liberty is structured it has sort of the skin that goes on it and then there's a structure underneath that has it's not a one-to-one -one relationship it's an Eiffel project and then there's this third thing and these third things connect the two together and I'm kind of looking at your project wondering if you need that mechanism um, that's for instance I'll just give you an example above the dancers between the you know the this in related structure itself and then what they're doing because you know the more you dance the lower it goes I don't know there's it seems to be like a 
that it could have like a really uh, physically engaging um, response that would affect other, you know, the other inhabitants, their response as well. Yeah, that makes sense. I can definitely like see that now as I'm looking at it. Um, yeah, I, Emily, I, I really do agree with Mark and with Matt with that comment and and um, I, and I appreciate also the clarity of the presentation, the clarity of the drawings, and also you know it's like um, trying to really think through in what ways you can actually materialize your ideas. Um, but I keep wondering as well, like whether the poly system um, is necessary, um, or if there um, if there is a way in which um, the poly system could you know be something that contracts or expands the, the, the tubes more than just being, you know, a circulation or platforms that allow for, you know, like a, a flat surface to actually um, exist within the project. So I would just say like, you know, recognize the project and the virtues of, of the material that you're uh, engaging with as a new, you know, ground zero condition, right? everything is inflatable. Every time I walk, someone will feel my presence in the way that Matt was alluding to, right? So if, you know, a thousand people are jumping on top of this, you know, we will feel the reverberation of that somewhere else in the project, right? So we're constantly noticing and feeling the presence of others just by, you know, this new ground that it's never stable, right? Um, so I, I think like that could be interesting. But then I was wondering if actually then the pulley system could be something, a mechanism that exists as an exterior condition that people on the ground, the actual ground of the park are just pulling and, or, you know, or letting go, letting loose, right? Aspects of the project. So the, like new curvatures um, start to appear, right? So, you know, I can see the project always changing. So it could have been great, like in the same way as you have, you know, um, your, um, your little uh, um, GIF image of how this things uh, exist on the site, maybe even the section, how like the section could change adapting to, you know, multiple uses or even, you know, multiple presences uh, of people within the spaces, right? Like how, you know, um, because of, you know, the amount of uh, compression or weight there is in one side, you know, the, the inflatable can just bend, right? So it, it, it's never a flat thing, right? So maybe, you know, there could be like one collective bed because everyone is there and we're all sitting there and, you know, like this entire thing becomes a hammock, right? Like a collective hammock. Um, so there's a lot about the project that, that, that I like and I like precisely how, you know, uh, it embraces uncertainty in a way like, I know that, you know, you want it to be, you know, pragmatic and put on, you know, the hat of the, you know, the person that knows how to solve this. But I think like the more you embrace it's, you know, um, the flexibility of, of the system, um, the more interesting the project gets, right? Like uh, understanding how, oh, because it is like this, I can put one on top of the other and it creates this deformation that allows for someone to maybe not, you know, uh, walk on a space, but actually crawl. Right, uh, so there are all of these aspects that I really, really like, um, and the the aspect that that I I really enjoyed is like understanding how vital or crucial it is to have uh, places of play um, in urban spaces in general that are not just for one you know demographic like let's say kids, but for everyone, right? Like I would have so much fun in your project, to be honest, right? Uh, you know, being able to take off my shoes and then, you know, just go about your project like freely. Like I would totally enjoy that a lot, right? Um, so maybe there is something about that social condition, like the importance of play um, for every age that could be expanded or, or maybe, you know, um, claimed uh, as one of the motivations behind the project as well, right? Um, because I think like we don't talk that much about this, but you know, like it is important to you know also consider um, the be the benefits of having this sort of structures for you know different demographic when it comes to tackle 
you know, um, mental health in cities or, you know, like the possibilities of, you know, letting yourself loose in spaces that, you know, embrace um, the, the, those sort of qualities. So, I mean, the project, I think it excels in the sort of questions it asks. And, and I mean, I, I, I think this applies to everyone. I think the, all of your projects are successful, not because they solve particular pro problems, but because they ask very alluring questions that, you know, that can be answered, not just with one particular project, but with many projects that you guys will end up doing throughout your uh, education. So I would embrace that uncertainty, right? Like the project or the studio is trying to guide you guys um, towards that, right? Like that, you know, architecture is not just a, a problem solving discipline, but is actually an intellectual act, right? So sometimes it is not about, you know, bringing answers, but maybe just asking better questions. Um, so I think like uh, that is something that, that if you can take from this project and as you move on, that would be incredible. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, Fernanda, that with, was really uh, well put. Matt, do you have any closing comments for this project well, or for, I, for the studio in general? Yeah, yeah I, I wanted to thank you for sharing uh, your work with me. Um, I, um, I agree wholeheartedly um, with what Virginia said. I would, I would add that these sorts of projects um, are really, um, they really hit on what I think that uh, university and academia um, can do for the profession. We ask a lot of tough questions in practice. Um, a lot of the ideas that you're exploring, we talk about um, in the office, whether or not we, the solution is the same or not is, is really not the most significant part. It's simply that you're asking the questions and you're coming up with really interesting um, architecture that I think can, um, can have an impact um, on obviously on yourselves, but also on the profession. I've always thought that architecture, for whatever reason, is one of the few uh, um, few academic programs that sometimes follow the the, the profession itself, um, unlike science and other parts of uh, the university. And so it's it's really exciting for me to be a part of. Uh, this project and to see you all pushing the envelope and really challenging the profession to um, think about uh, the possibilities of architecture, not as a dead end solution, but as something that opens up um, a whole nother universe. Um, so I, I would, I, all the projects we've seen are really commendable as, as the project itself. Thank you. Thank you both so much. It was really a pleasure to hear your feedback and to hear your position on the, the necessity for speculative work in our, in our profession and in the academy. Um, I know the students are not always faced to think this way in our school in particular, and so I appreciate the support that your feedback has given them to further pursue their, their studies with advanced design in the coming semesters in a way that doesn't always try to solve the detail in the way it might be done out in the field, but to maybe instead, or as well as think about the kind of questions that we can be asking that will further us as a, as a discipline. Uh, so thank you. And I think that um, on that note, we can say goodbye. And thank you to our first four presenters. You did a really fantastic job in sharing your projects and, and putting them together. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you for having us. And thank you so much for, for the work. Yes. yes okay. Thank you. thank you. Y'all see everything? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, hi, I'm Hugo, and uh, this is the Conscious Palace, my concept and proposal for a cybernetic theater at Auditorium Shores. And it is an evolution of my initial concept for the previous project, which was something uh, close to uh, control and who has control. And with this project, I wanted to uh, investigate that more, showing control related to the environment or with 
the users and people in building itself. So moving from that, a little bit of background for the second project. It's this device that uh, ties in, uh, that people attach to themselves to each of their respective limbs. And it basically, it puts them together, but also splits them apart. And it serves to uh, encourage a cooperation in performing simple tasks uh, that usually would be very individual. And with this, the aim was also to uh, critique who has control. For this device, let's say if you're drinking a cup of coffee, you could either work together to, uh, to make things easier or one person could tell the other what to do. And in the end, that's uh, what decided how something was done. Now, how this building was done, the Conscious Palace, is I looked at my site a bit to give the uh, basic form of it and some conceptual ideas. And Auditorium Shores is pretty flat with the exception of some of these walls of trees that have some really uh, distinct openings showing across uh, sh that uh, create a view across uh, the Colorado River towards downtown Austin. So I thought that was a really good uh, form to continue into my building. And also the whole juxt juxtaposition that when you're there, you see these trees and above them, you see these rising skyscrapers. So that's another thing I took into the consideration of the form of the conscious palace. But primarily because this is such a, a flat space uh, with the trees being the only shading and only really particular spots, I developed this inflatable structure that uh, it inflates and creates shadow depending on the outside conditions. If it's hot, uh, the air in the inside causes an expansion and provides more shading on the inside. If it's cold, it just contracts. Another uh, thing with the Conscious Palace is the aspect of water. Water can also be used to cool this. So in a particularly hot day, water can be pumped from the Colorado River into the palace and uh, allow for a little bit of water cooling, or maybe it is raining a lot and we want to show, and I want to show that. So I'll uh, have water pump in. And here you can see just everything in action. Now looking at the interior, there's the uh, beginning of the division of space. There's this heavy core where all the necessities are at, bathrooms, eating, drinking, while at, uh, next to it are the more free areas where you can more or less decide what you're going to what's going to happen what you're going to do of course these are still limited because you uh, and this in the conscious palace you don't have complete control but as you can see here yeah there's the two uh, the central core the heavy core with everything important and the sides with more free space as well as the curved form that is the abstract empty form space that you can do, that the user can do whatever you want. And hey, Ugo, 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 can I, can I ask one question? When you say that, that these are the things that, and then you said something like, well, of course you don't have control. Yeah. What, what, do you, what did you mean versus, so what parts do you have control of and which ones do you, you don't have control of? So, uh, I mean control in the sense that there's some things that you're able to do, like uh, there's, and I'll go into a little bit more detail here on a later slide, but there's these okay. platforms that you can physically pull up. But of course, there are platforms that uh, I've deliberately put there. So you have some level of control, but you can't change, for instance, the shape of the platform or you can't uh, remove the platform, just as an example. Control in that sense, there's, you can play around with the stuff that's there but you can't add or remove stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, in section, there's a bit more of the spatial concept above. Uh, there's the uh, a detail of the core area where you can see where there's all this mechanical tectonic shapes um, really distinct from the bottom where it shows more of the uh, open, more playful spaces that there's it's just more open, more free to use. And also the heavy pochade space that hides the mechanical stuff that makes everything possible and prevents the 
conscious palace from sinking into the ground like a canoe or a kayak. In terms of spatial organization, the circulation um, really serves to, as a division of everything, it divides the uh, enclosed necessity spaces like eating and uh, bathrooms from the public and free uh, leisure and exhibition spaces. And it also separates inside, outside, or up and down, like the form that is outside and goes down, down uh, below the building, and which in turn can be used as a more free space where it has none of my, none of really any intricacies, and it can become either flooded or empty. And below and above, there's a bit of uh, services hidden, not to really be seen that much by the users. And finally, uh, from the cybernetic, the from the uh, theater part of the building, is where most of this camp most it's the epitome of the project I feel because it shows a little bit of everything. You can see above there's this inflatable roof just over there, uh, giving a, uh, just floating around. Uh, in the background, you can see a more hidden enclosed. You can barely see the hidden enclosed eating space. You can make out the circulation with the stairs and a few of the trusses. You see this rocker just uh, using the theater space to his uh, desire because he wants to put on a show. And this could also be changed to be completely flat for maybe a theater performance of Macbeth or something of the sort. And there's also people carefully observing social distancing rules with these seatings that can be adjusted to become chairs. And all in all, from, from, if you were to look at this project from just this space, you will get a good idea if you were a user of what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Thanks, Hugo. Can you go back to one of the images that shows the, the, the balloon roof? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask, too. <laughs> uh, the animation? Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that well, one. Yeah, that's a good one. Go ahead, Juan. We're probably thinking. Yeah, I'm well, I, 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 I mean, I think it's, it's as, as opposed to Amber. See, what happens, Amber, is that we, because we teach here, so we know some of the students. So we, we bring more history. And, and, and Hugo, uh, I, I cannot help but think about how you have evolved. And, 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 and I like very much. Uh, how the overall project feels like uh, uh, that you have managed to not be too rigid and too stiff. One of the things that I, you know, when when I had you as a student, sometimes it felt like you 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 had ideas that were very very interesting, but sometimes in the execution it felt a little a little uh, rigid and it had to be loosened a little bit. And here it, it looks like you have managed to to create a very nice balance of the aesthetics. The plan resolution, the sections, the overall aesthetic is 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 uh, is uh, is a very nice evolution of your work. I like I like what is going in the sense of what I what I remember from you. You you have maintained all the good things that I remember, and you have added more kind of finesse in the in the way you know everything is is, is resolved. So that I like that a lot, and and I think that you have been bold also about the ideas that you. You don't have a problem having having bold ideas, and that's that's a good thing. But I think that the project came together in a very nice way. So I just I, I had a couple of comments, and and one of them is I know that uh, Danel has said that this being a speculative studio, it didn't really put the same pressure that, for example, you had last semester when we had to deal with more issues that are expected of a, the integration studio, but. Uh, what, one thing that I noticed is that you, you can be very uh, specific in terms of the structural armature of your project in some parts, but then in others that are super you know, interesting in terms of the proposal itself of the balloons, even if you are not supposed to resolve it, it looks like the, the whole premise of the palace the when I look at those drawings of the cranes and is the is the beauty of like this uh, world of machines and technology playing roles in, in, in shaping our lives 
and, and, and I miss a little bit the, the sense of your speculation as to how these balloons could really work, you know, as, as a source of not necessarily feeling obliged to know everything, but mm -hmm. as, a, as a source of inspiration for the project itself in terms of falling in love who, and coming up with an inventive way of thinking about it. But right now it feels like either you have not really talked about it or I don't see it, but it feels like it's that investigation of the technological aspect ended in the, in the, in the bar that goes across. But I didn't see the, the notion of how that uh, kind of inventive uh, structure could, could be a, a, an element that could be a layer. It's almost like a layer that I would like to have added to, the, to everything that I see that I like a lot. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a kind of uh, my, my reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's exactly what I was thinking because I love the balloon aspect of your project. I think it's super strong. It starts to also speak to this idea of almost an airship, something that um, could be suspended rather than anchored into the ground, thinking about how these this layer of balloons could function both as a bottom and a top. And so that would be the one thing you go that would be nice if you had gotten to that point to really think about how that connects, what's the structure that holds that? Is it like a sail or is it actually kind of something that's much more rigid? Um, but I agree with Juan, I was thinking the exact same thing having taught you in first year, um, that it's really nice to see this development and that you've, you, you've managed to keep some of the the more rigid parts of your design process, but also been able to, in the Danelle studio, to loosen up and let some ideas come through that, um, that are that are more whimsical. Oh, Amber, you are you are you are muted. Your turn. <laughs> Do I have to unmute you? Yeah. There I got you go. it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm so in fear of like causing a disturbance during one of the students' presentations that I always mute it. Um, but I was just going to say, it's so nice, Hugo, that your former instructors are here and able to like sort of weigh in. Um, even without that former knowledge, I can see that you have a kind of technical capacity um, with certain types of structure that you're very comfortable with. Um, and then there's this experimental piece that you are just sort of dipping your toes into getting wet and you're a little um, afraid of letting that have um, unless in this kind of uh, vein of speculative and indeterminate like it does seem like those pieces are still obeying a kind of rigid structure um, like like the inflatable pieces could have uh, been originally conceived of as metal and maybe they became the inflatables later it seems like the inflatables need to have more um, agency of their own and not just like one dimensional perhaps. Um, but that said, I love the environmental response factor. I think that's incredibly appropriate to the location that, where you're at. And I, um, my note in here was like, I need some diagrams that would uh, help me understand this. And then you went back to this uh, GIF and I'm just like, this is fantastic. This is exactly what he needs. I would actually activate these even more. You know, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's probably in this day and age, we need to rely more on um, uh, annotation in the drawings because so much of what we're conveying can't come through just through talking. Um, so your verbal presentation did help support this, but I would say take it a step further and really kind of annotate this so we understand uh, more of the actions that are happening. Um, but all in all, I really appreciate uh, this as a kind of opening up project to um, our day today. So thank you. Thank you. But Ugo, Ugo, do you know do you know what what we mean with the sense of uh, that layer that we feel missing in terms of how how the the, the balloons? I mean, inform me more about how they can work diagrammatically. I think could have helped. So I agree with Amber. But do you know what we mean in terms of like this uh, notion of that you could have used the thinking about how this can really work? as a way to address, you know, the excitement that the project wants to bring. So that we're seeing it not as a burden that we want to put on you. It's more like a, a tool for you to 
have developed the project by imposing that as a as a as a as a component of the project in terms of oh let me let me kind of come up with how this really could could be even if it's even if it ultimately is not expected to be fully resolved you you know what what we mean yeah uh, especially yeah because here it's really just serving as one it's just doing one thing it could definitely do uh, something else or play into a different part of everything maybe maybe it suspends stuff from it or maybe it creates a more spatial aspect but uh here i limited myself too much to just one use for it yeah and it's, i mean i think the use of cables so you i can imagine like cables pulleys and things and then you know this is one of the things that you can start kind of dreaming about because i agree i mean the notion that this is tied to a sense of how much shadow how hot how hot it is how so and even this control not control that you're proposing of saying hey whether you like it or not these are going to grow when it's hot and this is you know so there's a sense of like things are going to happen independently and some things you can control so it would be like the, some of these things you can say okay we no matter what we have this and and this beyond this we just don't control anymore i think that notion of the control no control that you were bringing could could have been made more explicit you know maybe in terms of like the things that you need to agree with someone. I mean, I think that device that you came up with, with a tool, you know, is uh, interesting. I don't know if you used it, you know, to 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 get coffee or the things that you were saying, but I, <laughs> we I, tried. I, I, yeah, I think that is. was going to be my my comment to you to you, Hugo, is that I, if we had another two weeks uh, to see how your apparatus could operate within your your proposed building and space and how events might occur with the apparatus in hand, because I do think that, that it has an incredible applicability these days that we're, um, I think could, could really relate to, but I want to really commend you on your motivation and commitment to the project in a very short time. This, this whole project really started just after the break and which we know was not a typical uh, six weeks, but I really think that Hugo is always very committed and and pursues things to a degree that is uh, always very easy and delightful to discuss each each desk to crit. So, thank you for your work. Yeah, no, thank it's you. fantastic. It's fine. I agree. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's very it's very nicely represented. And again, as I, I I'm very happy because I see these your work evolving in very very good mm -hmm. ways. So it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Hugo. Thank you. So I think we have uh, Danae, you're up next, correct? Um, yeah. Yes, I thought so, okay. And you'll share your screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Danae. And uh, this is my project. It's called Bubble Space. And as you can see by the animations, there's going to be a lot of bubbles. Um, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to take you guys kind of back in time to talk about the origin of bubble architecture. And so my precedents were these two projects, Cushical and Doodaloon and the Restless Sphere. And they both looked at the like shape of a bubble in the sense of kind of just around one person or a small group of people and just encasing them. And I wanted to take that idea and expand it and push the boundaries of it, which brings us to my project, which is the entire building. And so it was developed um, kind of in the animation that you saw on the first page through these three bubbles and then um, expanding them and then having more bubbles expand off of those this core three. And then for this interior pink piece, I, I took one of the bubbles from the exterior and ex extended it into the um, space that was created. And then that brings us to plans and sections. So um, the theater part is the entire like white, um, this exterior bubble space is the entire theater. And then the interior piece is a cafe that overlooks it and you can see 
out um, to Austin or you could look down and view the performances that are going on or whatever. Um, there's some interior views. So this, this black and white view on the left uh, is the entrance and it, uh, I wanted it to become, I wanted the building to become this like uh, kind of different world and change the way that people view what a building should be. So challenging that rectilinear kind of flat surfaces that we normally associate with buildings. And so- uh, Dan, Dan, which one was the entrance you said? This black and white one on the bottom left. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, in order to bring you into the space and kind of transition you in there, uh, you go underground through the doorway and then you would either uh, go up this elevator or you would go around the ramp and you'd be uh, kind of enveloped in this bubble area. So. And then for the, for the theater part, I didn't want to uh, strictly assign a specific use for it. So I allowed it to be this open area where you could do whatever you want. You could put on a performance, you could just sit and read, or you could sit and draw, or you could just watch people. Um, or you could have a sword fight if you wanted to and just allow it to become whatever people wanted it to be. So, yeah. Thank you, Danae. Um, I am really like delighted with the possibility of these beautiful opalescent bubbles and what kind of like what what that kind of structure might be like sitting in the site right up against the water um and i <laughs> but i'm i i think i'm wanting to make you push it farther and i'm wondering with like our current situation and the whole six foot social distancing and things like that um i it must have occurred to you that everybody has to live in a bubble yeah it, <laughs> and what dissuaded you from pursuing that at all? How did you end up with a kind of more architectural solution with flat floors instead of maybe, um, not necessarily, that's not the only direction that you can go, but why is it that the bubble only sort of becomes this outside frame and it's not more about how you move through the piece? Like for the movement through the building, it seems like we're relying on pretty normative architectural dimensions, flat floors, the circular staircase, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, can you go so, to the plan? Can you go to the plan of the of the all the section of the building? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because it does seem like the occupation of the bubble, uh, uh, oc occupation of the bubbles and people being in them is critical to your original idea. It's in your precedence for sure. It's <laughs> critical in Sudaloon. Um, and you were probably pushed to like try to get beyond that one idea, but somehow it seems like maybe the architecture accommodates people in these bubbles. I can imagine um, like if we're really pushing this, right? Like imagine mm -hmm. if you had to show up in one of these social, like not just a mask anymore, we all have to have our little bubble. And then yeah. like the way that you move through this building and sort of your um, cylindrical piece suggests that this might exist, just like those bank uh, vacuum tubes. And so like you actually are get like, you know, move from floor to floor in like these kind of vacuum tubes kind of things. Um, and so I think like the bubble idea is beautiful and I'm really wanting you to push it more and not, um, not be scared of exploring what that could, could be. I did think about it in terms of like moving through the building. You could in theory move in a bubble. Um, I did keep that kind of idea. But mm -hmm. You know, I, when I was go ahead, Denise, working, sorry. Uh, when I was designing the building, it kind of like I didn't want to complicate it too much by adding in a whole bunch of different shapes on the floor. Mm -hmm. And I felt that like walking on bubbles would be kind of difficult. Well, I think um, there's a lot of things that could be difficult about the project. So I'm not sure I would let myself stop <laughs> at the idea of walking on a bubble because there are so many other reality issues that 
that could also be difficult. But I agree with Amber's comments. And I think I, as I was watching it, there's something really strong about the idea I kept coming up with. I was making notes for myself, all these different things that it was making me think about. But I was wishing that you had pushed something in it that, that was sort of taking it in another direction. I mean, I wrote, first of all, second skin those initial images you showed where the bubble and what Amber's suggesting, like what if we're all in our own bubble and it becomes our, our outer shell, um, albeit a soft one, but it's something that protects us and it also forces a certain distance. Mm -hmm. um, I think about that sometimes when I'm now out, you know, walking to the grocery store, doing something I, I want, you know, I want a hula hoop around me to sort of keep, keep people at their distance. And then I also started thinking you're bringing up issues of heavy and light. You have this sort of underground section, poche, but then in another image, you show people down in that space. And there's kind of this odd contrast between what's below the ground and what's above. And when I think of bubbles, I think of something very elevated and, and wonder if this could sort of gently be almost like a, a gemstone in a ring and how it's held. If there's something um, about that, that that you could be considering. And then also just this idea of, of seeing in and, and seeing out, because thinking about people, what it's like to be outside of this construct looking in versus inside looking out. And, and then in some of these places where you're inside a bubble, inside another bubble, how does that start to impact? So I think the, the project, my point is it, it, it makes me think about a lot of really interesting ideas that I, I keep wishing you had picked something to kind of push it one, a little bit farther because uh, it's a strong initial concept, I think. Yeah, I think that in a way it's almost like a, like a dream of a building because it's a, it's a building that has just this skin and nothing else. That's one of uh, one of the things about inflatable buildings, right? This is this is, you know, the concept of the inflatable buildings that are pretty real. I mean, there are some here at UT, right, for the practice facilities that mm -hmm. the notion that this will need some air pressure to keep to keep this uh, uh, going. I think that I, I agree with the with the comments in in, in the sense that uh, uh, the 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 thing that probably we're, we're missing is more take it another step you know is it whatever direction it could be i mean the personal bubble obviously is very applicable with the world that we live in now uh, joyce i don't know if you've seen the picture there was a guy that showed up in the in in, a, in an apartment store with a donut around him that it was basically guaranteeing <laughs> that you know i don't know if you've seen the photos he just, he i haven't suspenders. seen that yeah he had suspenders. Oh, I, I, he was walking around with this inflatable uh, donut around him and, and there's another there's another thing that you may have seen is this soccer where, where people play bubble soccer, where they, mm -hmm. they basically have oh, yeah. gigantic bubbles and when they, they collide and then everybody falls to the ground. And it, but that's something that maybe they, they're going to start playing leagues of that sport because it guarantees that people cannot touch each other. You know, right. so you're playing, but you, when you collide, you, you never touch each other because it's the bubble that collides <laughs> with the other bubble. So it's very funny to see because people fall all the time and they don't have control and it's, you know, everybody laugh and everything. I don't know if they're, they're trying to promote that sport now, but I would say that those are specific ideas that could have been taken. I think another approach is almost this imaginary war where you say, okay, when you go inside this bubble, you're safe and the world outside has all these things and there's this sense of, you are inside the bubble and means that you are in this other world. That's probably more what you are going for. I think that's what Danae was going for, is that yes. other version that you're describing of yeah, of that, the, they, yeah the that there's another zone of this, this building. Yeah. And so when I look at that, I, I feel like that's more has more legs, you know, this approach from the point of view of the the kind of issues of the studio. For me, I think the things that become interesting that I think that you have uh, imply but not fully tell us is this beautiful way for example for how you enter so when I ask you what is the entrance and then you say oh it's here but then I didn't quite see what it works but you did exactly what I was uh, you know hoping in a way because I didn't see it very well but the notion that you go under 
and then you emerge inside the bubble. And there's a, there's a whole opportunity there for how you enter into the space that it could be a very interesting process that is connected to your idea about the project. Again, I just want to emphasize that sometimes trying to figure out these things is not about, oh, it's a speculative. I don't need to worry about those things. I think that I will use them to tell the story in ways that enriches your project, not as, a, as, as an easy way out, say, oh, I don't have to worry about egress. So I say, yes, of course, you don't have to worry about egress, but you may want to work on things that can be very, way, very beautiful way to tell the story about how you go through here and then you go through a, you know, a tunnel and maybe in that tunnel something happens that when you emerge in there, you are free from any virus and anything. So everybody can be free and go there and not worry about all this. Something that you can start is creating a narrative in your own way. It feels like, in a way, where, you, where we're missing is a little bit that second layer of complexity that comes from you pushing another agenda that it could be, you know, helping us uh, uh, get a richer sense of how this can be an amazing feature in the middle of this park of like how when people are allowed to go in how do they go in what happens when they go in what happens when they're inside when they're outside but as a, as a kind of aesthetic of the section and the plan that we have here in front of us it's just fantastic in terms of the the notion of a building that can adopt this shape in planning in section i think that is uh is uh the inflatable architecture looks like it goes through these phases and it you know there's a level of interest and goes down and there's some a little, little a lot, a, another level of interest so it would probably come back but i think that getting a little more of these technical aspects and when i say technical it's just okay if you're going underground show us how you go underground that's not like you know a, a complicated thing to do in the sense that it could be a very important feature in your project right and and the notion of how these uh, inflatable uh, structure is floating inside is do you change the air inside do you, I, I don't know it's, it's, it's a little bit that second approach but i think that the one that you went for in terms of creating a building that is a contrast to the world outside especially in the times that we live is a very uh, strong approach uh, i think that we, we just wanted a little more that's that's mm -hmm. that's what i'm missing and i think that the other reviewers were too okay yeah, i think that's a fair comment i I totally agree with everything that's been said, but I do just want to commend you, Danae, for challenging yourself to think outside of the box, to, to, to think about an other way that we could imagine space that's as thin as a you know, single piece of plastic separating us from another, another world and how difficult it was for Danae just to get to a point of like, how do I even process this. I mean, we talked about her blowing bubbles and photographing them, modeling it, using parametrics, using, I mean, like, how do you even begin to start to achieve the process of developing this direction? And so I, I just want to commend you for stepping up to that challenge. And, and I think that all of the opportunities that have been stated for ways of going, the different directions that you could take this are really exciting. And I, I hope that you continue this research um, in other ways, if not this one. Thank you. Danae, does it make sense some of the things that we're saying? Just want to yeah. make sure you have any questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, Just... I it. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Danae. Right. Thank you, okay. Danae. Thanks. Thank Danae. you. Okay. Do we have next? Um, let me just look quickly. So, oh, sorry, David. Did we skip you? Yeah, but but it's fine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just said something. So, uh, you can go now. <laughs> okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. Fernando, I didn't have the list in front of me and I just saw Danae on the screen and thought she's- Oh yeah, no, for a reason. Ladies go first. No. Okay. Uh, you go by David or Fernando? Uh, Fernando. Fernando. That's what I thought, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so my project, uh, hello, my name is Fernando. My project is called Field Play. Uh, it is meant to be an extension of the ground that incorporates into the site and complements it. Uh, it is done or achieved by shifting and rippling the shape of the ground to create space uh, underneath. No, that, that creates space underneath and it allows for activities to take place in the park to be uninterrupted. So the same activities that were already taking place in the park and to bring in new activities and allow for more creativity and recreation. Uh, here's a manifesto that kind of drove my project. This was an early drawing. Uh, so my experience of this site is uh, going to, as a professor mentioned, it's a very versatile uh, site that houses different activities such as concerts, uh, people running, uh, people in the lake, that as we, uh, as we experience the site while basically uh, going through the lake or coming through the, the city or the street. And then also, you know, uh, the main idea, I don't know if it's very clear in this manifesto, but it's to, since we are gonna have to do a building here, not interrupt the activities that already go there or happen, take place there, rather complement them and give, pro, give platform for the same activities and also um, new activities. Uh, in this diagram, we can see how this shape kind of started helping this, this thing that I wanted to do. Uh, we can see the, the green space where you can, uh, it extends from the ground over here and it continues all the way to the top. Then we can see how you can uh, access the through the trail. It doesn't interrupt it. It creates a space here, but now it has different activities that you can do. Um, here's a section that's kind of more clear of how the space is looking, how this shape and this language is repeated and how it takes you all the way to the, to the building. Uh, you can access, the, here's, here's like the main access, access point and then you can, it shows how you can also access it from the lake by having this, this shape coming out as a deck here or also coming out to the mid level where the theater space is. Uh, here's a plan. Uh, and also showing the, how the trail is integrated into the building and how it takes you, and how you can interact with this, with this building while keeping the same, the, uninterrupting the site. There's uh, another plan of the middle or second floor, I guess, where the theater is. Uh, you can see here how you can access it through this part also. What do you mean that you can access it, uh, uh, Fernando? What do you mean that you can access it? That's the second floor, right? Yes, so looking back to my section, you oh, can okay. Okay, I got it. How got this it, it okay. has a, a hole in the slab there, and okay. um, one of the comments in my portfolio in my for my portfolio review was to to have more egress and clearer egress and circulation. So th this is kind of how you get up here. I also had to include a, an elevator core, but this is mainly how you're supposed to get get to that area. Uh, Here's my theater. Uh, explain, going back to my, my theater and going back to assignment two, uh, we, did, we created this apparatus right here that's like a helmet that has a, a mirror face, uh, but you can, you can flip that mirror. It's a double mirror. So it creates either the privacy of knowing that no one can see you and they can only see your reflection. But since it's a double mirror, you can see them 
So that was like a play at privacy and inhibition and how we don't get much privacy anymore. So that was the whole point of that assignment. And, and then you can flip it and it's the other way around where you can't see anyone, you can only see yourself, but everyone can see you. So it cre creates that inhibition. And that tied up perfectly to my, my theater because I, I kept thinking, how can I make my theater cybernetic and how can I tie back my assignment to into the this theater? And before I, most of the project, I had a, a regular theater, but then, uh, I came up with tying it back to that to that assignment to mirror uh, accessory, but you know, so it is now uh, like a mirror house, but rather than having only mirrors, it has. Uh, double space mirrors like in this in this you can see in this plan where performers are there so while you experience this room you bump into a gla the, the G means glass M means mirror and D is double sided mirror so you bump into yourself, you bump into a glass you're just experiencing that mirror in that way so it creates this rather than having an accessory that creates division and privacy it's like a room that creates this. Fernando, I just have a quick question. Uh, yes, the spaces where the double-sided uh, mirrors are, are, is that where the performers are? Like, yes, can you get in uh, those spaces? Yes, as you can see in this uh, kind of per interior perspective, this performer right now is inside mm -hmm. that double-sided mirror. And okay. you can see here, there's spaces created where they can stand. So. That, that's what that is. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to check. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, and here's a, a perspective of, the, of how the, bu the building looks as you arrive from the site. As you can see here, you can interact with the building in different ways while, the, while you can rest over here, you can play with your dog, you can go to this space. Uh, so it's a very, since we already have to put a building in there, I wanted to not interrupt with the activities because I know Austin, the city of Austin people love the parks and love to go around and, and they wouldn't like just a big block just interrupting their daily activities. So as I said, it complements it and here's another perspective view of how you see this building as a runner's perspective. So, yeah. Is that your last slide, Fernando? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, can you go back to your cybernetics theater for just a second? Here. Yeah. How long have you had this idea? Has it been like ruminating for a little while in the background? I know it comes from your original or your kind of um, performance piece. Yes, um, this is a rather new idea. Mm -hmm. new, I, I, before I just had like a glass theater that was <laughs> not cybernetic at all. But yeah. I, I included this. Maybe it's not the same language or the same like what, what the the drivers of the project were, but this mm -hmm. is a room that's dedicated to assignment two and dedicated to cybernetic mm -hmm. and to kind of what Cedric Price's spaces looked like. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the I mean, I think you're absolutely aware of the um, juxtaposition between these two pieces, but I, I really like this at part of your project. Um, I think it's really apropos to the way that we, you know, the, the contextual, the social context that you are challenged with the um, brief to engage. Um, I think when it moved to the scale of the site, you um, were operating using um, a vocabulary that you're more familiar with. So the kind of moving of the um, groundscape up and down and um, even the way that you talk about the, the pieces shifting, 
moved away from the idea of like how people are necessarily operating it or, the, or people are operating it in a kind of conventional way. Like, you know, oh yeah, we'll walk up on the roof, um, which we've seen in, in other precedents. And that not, that's not to take away from that. Oh, that's a nice move. But um, there's a unknown factor in the cybernetic theater that I think is really fascinating. And I like the idea of as you move through the building, there might be more of this opening and closing or like reveal and um, hidden components to the facade that we see. Um, and so I think that's actually in there a bit in your section when we look, when we were talking about like that, that hole in the center of the floor that we don't necessarily see exclusively from the outside. And so mm -hmm. there's already a bit of this in your uh, work. And I would just love to see these things push on one another more. And I know that's a terrible thing to say, oh, you know, if you only had two more weeks. Um, but as you are resolving this for your portfolio, you obviously have some facility with rendering and so forth. And it would be really interesting for some of what we see in this, this collage you put together on the right-hand side to come back out and allow the people who are users of the building to actually be um, active performers as well. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. And I, I kept thinking um, when you showed your second project, which I really loved, the, um, the headgear with the mirror that can go in different directions and taking that idea into this. I, and you talked a lot about how people of Austin like to have their activities, their outdoor activities, how they could become part of the performance in this place and how could this idea start to engage the runners running by? Do they see themselves? Do they see something else reflected or they see through the, the glass or the mirrors? And so I think just picking up on Amber's comments, sort of how could this idea go farther? I, I think, I know you were concerned, or it seems like you were concerned about making a building a little bit more than some of the other projects we've seen. Yeah. And if you imagine this image, your plan on the left of this theater, if you take those walls away, how could this start to kind of ooze out into other parts of your project? So that there might still be this more normative kind of space making that it's, it's in, invaded by this other system, which is really interesting, I think. Could you, and, Fernando, could you go back to the section or that side view or yes yeah, because, yeah here so i think it's true that there's a little bit of a um a sense that this uh, second exercise made its way to the building as a kind of self-contained you know it's almost like a curator of that space just had that idea and then they they put it there it's not inherently part of the of the building I mean, I think that the building is very is very interesting, you know, in its own way, in, independently of that investigation that you did in the second exercise that could or could have not been part of the of the of this of this building. I think that even the animation that you started with this the notion of these being as uh, the ground emerging, and this is something that we see more in buildings that are you know embedded in the landscape. But it, I think that I like the simplicity of the of the of the plan doing that a rectangle that takes you to the water, and I think that's that's what makes the difference. I mean, I think that in a way you you can say, look, the because you have a lot of ground in a park, but what you're doing here is you're getting that sense of getting closer to the water without interruption to the trail and the runners running underneath. So. It creates a very interesting space underneath potentially but i think that the notion of that as an overlook looking at the city jumping from there getting getting a very different unexpected uh ground so i think that from that point of view i think is is, is very nicely uh, developed i mean i think that the the notion of that second second move from the ground up to go to the second floor i think is it, it would have been better i like that move i think it would be better if it had not been done with the same grass going up i mean i think that that didn't belong to that world you could you could have used steps and, and and a way to make that whole thing a gigantic stair steps that can be used for other things but making the same move i mean i think making the same move is always kind of a little questionable i think that when i look at the section it feels like okay i think it works pretty well 
but maybe not with the grass, not maybe with something different. And it, it gets it gets more richness to their potential uses there. You can imagine like that being a place where people can look at a performance that is happening in the in, in the other uh, on the left. So I, I think that the the, the building is, is elegant in the proportions and in the move and in the flow over the water. I think I completely agree with uh, the notion that I think Joyce implied what both Amber and Joyce and in the, in the, how those wall of mirrors could have been maybe something that defines the second level as you look into the city. I mean, this is this is an overlook into the city that is very well positioned for that. And there's also the sense of activity of people watching when you're running, right? People like to go on Town Lake because you get to see all the people and it's encouraging and there's a lot of movement. And so the idea of those mirrors, seeing, not seeing, seeing, seeing the city, seeing people, see, could, could have been more integral part of maybe the whole scheme of this second level. Uh, and that would have been a little more integrated. I think that just going inside the wall and having that as a, another experience completely disconnected from everything else that you are proposing with the building itself. So in that regard, I think it's uh, uh, um, relatively easy to have integrated them that without really losing the, the big move mm -hmm. of the building, which I think mm -hmm. is the, the driving force for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just want to reiterate what Juan just said, because as we were looking at the section, I really appreciated that you activated it with people in your section. Um, but looking at this and then thinking back to your cybernetic theater, um, and even thinking about the way that your plans have these kind of very contained elements. Imagine if your theater and the field of columns that you have in the theater sort of just expand and you allow um, that idea to not just exist where you have the theater and maybe where the theater is positions and stops and starts is a much more vague. Um, and then here in your section, we would get some of that reflections and maybe, you know, it would be a sort of thing that you discover and there would be a difference between the ground condition coming up and what it reveals as if there's a kind of crystalline body underneath um, that moving the landscape up um, has allowed you to see. Um, so I think the, the thing I'm trying to get to here is a compliment for the ideas that you have proposed and not really just a critique of where you are because I think where you are is just a product of like, you know, this is the end of the semester. So just keep going yeah. with these great ideas. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with everything that's been said. It's a really solid con concept and one that I could even imagine working really, really well here, but at the same time has a degree of speculation that gives it difference to what we would typically uh, see as something. And I, I just wish that your idea of the theater had come sooner or that the translation from your second project into this would have happened sooner, but I really appreciate all your hard work. It's, it's really been great to see. Yeah. Thanks, Fernando. Thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you. you, Fernando. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Okay, uh, let me just have a look. So, Amir? Hey. Hi. Hi, Amir. Oh. Hi there. How is everybody doing today? Are you in Good. Hawaii? No, I'm not actually. <laughs> I'm uh, okay. I'm in Dallas right now. Okay. <laughs> sort of the same. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. I was gonna be jealous. Yeah. Okay. I will share my screen one second. Okay. So um so this is my uh, project, it's called Tunnel Vision, and my name is Amir Mirza. Uh, I'll start off right here. So just kind of starting off with our first project, uh, we designed a helmet that was more of a critique on privacy and kind of the lack thereof in, in this day and age. Um, and we kind of pulled this from the artist Monica Bonvicini. Um, she designed a uh, restroom surrounded by one-way mirrors in the middle of London. And the idea from this was that we kind of have a helmet that's a one-way mirror. And when you wear it, you can see you can see out, but everybody can only see the reflection. And when you flip out, flip around the kind of slide that you can put in, uh, you could do the opposite kind of idea where you're looking at yourself and everybody can see yourself looking at you. And the idea behind um, kind of the red thing too, that's um, in the 
figure on the right is that it kind of expands upon what you see in art class where if you put like maybe a red film in or if you look through like a red looking glass it's like a different spectrum of light a different spectrum of i guess things that kind of appear uh that aren't compared to the naked eye so some of the idea that i kind of went with uh this project that i followed through on was um it's about traveling on ladybird lake and it serves as a powerful site with prominent nodes of emphasis uh, my aim was to make this movement of people from one destination to another along the river and experience in and of itself so through that i continued with the second project and i kind of uh, explored ideas of public and private and inside and outside. So this is kind of the three nodes that I thought of. And on our, on our kayaking trip, I noticed that these points, the pedestrian bridge, um, our intended site, which was this middle part, uh, the old sea home building over here, they kind of all acted as like three main spots that I thought could be served well throughout the, pro um, throughout the project. And I thought human activity could occur on each one. So I thought, Maybe the project kind of travels from each point um, to these little, th these different spots and kind of stops there for a second. And this is kind of what the GIF is showing too. Um, it travels from place to place throughout the day. And then um, the program kind of evolves as well throughout the, uh, when the night nighttime occurs and almost turns into a light show of sorts. So that's kind of what's happening. And then, yeah, so that's kind of, that's the idea of, of like the main concept of where it's traveling to. And then on this, this is my program diagram. Essentially, uh, I drew directly from Cedric Price's program diagram and added the variety of programs that occur along the, the Town Lake site. So um, kind of on our, on our trip as well, Professor Briscoe said something that, that stuck with me on our, on our trip and it kind of influenced my thoughts on this. And she said, imagine how nice it would be if you're running at the park and at the end of the run, you have somewhere to pull up to, maybe get a drink, uh, sit down or relax for a minute. So that's kind of where the idea is like, okay, maybe there's people that are running or people that are kayaking on the river that kind of come to this spot and you, they're using it. And it just turned into a place to kind of hang out or relax or just take a break after exercise or just wanting to do something else that people do there, like taking pictures, um, seeing concerts, if anything occurs around there. So moving to this, it's kind of the idea is that it's a floating pontoon module lined with almost these air pipes that inflate these reflective pillows. And the idea behind the vertical movement of the users is that it's, it's like a rotating fin that carries participants from either floor uh, and it doubles as a way to move the project through the water. Um, and then over here, this is kind of just trying to show the expansive like idea of the project and that how, how tall it is and trying to give a scale to a little bit of where the people are and where they what they would be doing in it. Um, yeah, so next is like, so playing with this idea of the reflective like inflatable pillows. Um, I, I thought that they shift materiality and opacity throughout the day. So I tried to tie that back to the first project um, and the event from the inside as well as an outside. Um, that the project is an event from the inside and the outside and that people partaking in the ride, um, they kind of own the space and experience it in a different setting than those who are kind of viewing it from afar. Um, and that's kind of what I tried to show here where the aim, aim is that they're even tying it back into that other project again, is that maybe when people are wearing these, uh, the helmets and the, they kind of experience like a, a silent disco of sorts where like, while these people kind of experience their own augmented reality or they all are in their own space, but at the same time, they're partaking in this like big event, which is the building. And that's kind of what I figured could kind of be shown here. And what's going on here is like just how people could kind of approach it um, if when it's docked and where people uh, would kind of be seeing it in relation to everything else. The inflatable pillows I'm here are they so because you when you in some some ways that you you render them almost like a square they're they're soft they're just inflatable material is like plastic what what are what are what are you imagining yeah um I, I envision it as, as almost like a, a inflatable plastic okay. uh yeah okay Amir do you envision this sort of being on a schedule that it 
it moves to certain locations at certain times and it's a, on a repeat? Or do you see it more as something that varies? I would say, I, I think, I don't see why it couldn't be, but I initially I didn't have it as on like a set schedule, but I, I think that's what I was aiming for, like uh, in that traveling gift that maybe it, it, it goes from wherever, wherever the users want to be. So I could see it at least coming from the, going from the bridge to the little different areas and wherever it needs to be, it needs to be. So I, I don't think I essentially had it on like a set schedule. I think that this is, I mean, if, uh, if you can rent it, this would be like the ultimate party, okay. <laughs> you know, going up and down the river, like for, you know, happy hours, it would be like a big hit, you know, believe me. I, I think that you, you have managed to integrate a lot of the things that I think the studio is, is about. I mean, from the point of view of the, the way the invitation to speculate can be connected to this uh, research to the fun palace and, I mean, and I think in a way, one of the things that I, I, I was mentioning before that you have embraced uh, at least to some level, the notion of how the technical park, you know, and, and we think about technology and innovation, the, the notion that a building can float and how it can float and how you, you have an armature that is supporting these inflatable pillows, you know, drawing and thinking about those things at the end helps in the sense that it's, it's basically giving more sense of what you what you have in mind. So I think that the notion that this could be extruded endlessly or it could be fragmented into modules, because the, the same, you, you show it all together, but I, I can't imagine that also this can be separated and you can start thinking about, well, it comes together. How big is your party? Okay, you need three modules. You know, how, you know, it's a small, it's a small gathering or so. You, you have a sense of modularity that makes this applicable. And I think that you have done a lot of work to make sure that it's understood in the context of Austin, which is where you are generating it. So obviously it could imagine this arriving in London, arriving in any, any city, almost like those uh, floatable archigram uh, cities that could go anywhere. But uh, I, I, I think that you, 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 you managed to get those layers in terms of the sense of connection to the site, even if it could be anywhere, the sense of connection with the excitement that uh, innovation and technology can bring to a place. I think that the connection with the previous research is uh, less obvious to me, this double side in terms of what, maybe I haven't understood completely how that plays a role, but I think it, I can imagine like this also as a vessel where you can imagine like a lot of other layers added to where we, where this big is big enough. I mean, I, I thought at the beginning it was much smaller, but I can see that it's big enough that you can really have a lot of uh, all the things happening inside that it could be another layer that can be the evolution of this the design for that for in general I mean I would say that it's a, it's a very successful project because you you did all these uh, all these things that is one of the things that I think the studio is about Amir I agree I'm totally enamored with the concept it's super charming I want to go to the party that's in here um, uh, I I think it's big enough that it also begs the question about the program right now. You've suggested some program, you know, like with these guys uh, canoeing in the middle of that. I think that's pretty fascinating. Um, and you've got some activation of the building or people interacting with the building and its um, function through your kind of elevator slash uh, or system, I guess. Um, I would love to see more of those things. I mean, the, the concept itself uh, still sort of relies on just a kind of a uh, cylinder of pillows that light up at night. And while that's incredible and beautiful and honestly enough to make a great building, uh, when we look into this thing, I'm wanting there to be like a little bit more of a capacity for me to interact with the building. So these kind of um, shelves that are in there um, and not, and maybe I'm reading it wrong, but it seems like it could be some way of act activating more of the center of that space. Um, or maybe activating more of the outside of the thing, um, you know, cut holes through it so that you can get more of that looking in, looking out that's part of the original project as well, or the, um, your, your second project, I think. Um, but I mean, all in all, like you can't help but sort of uh, 
you know, be filled with a little bit of joy, just thinking about like how much fun it would be to see this thing going down the river. And I don't think it's really, um, I think it, it, it's much bigger. I think it's Austin scale really more than it's just this little park. I mean, I could see, imagine it going up and down the Colorado river in a much larger fashion than, than just between these three small points, because that's not that far, right? Right. Oh, that's definitely not that far. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to um, jump on the bandwagon too and compliment you, Amir. I, yeah, it's a very joyful project. And, and I think Juan touched, said it, that, you know, it's speculative, but it's doable. Like it's something that could happen, which I think is even more exciting about it. And I can imagine it, it being there. Um, I also was thinking, given, given your second project and this idea when you had the view, the perspective view where you kind of get a peek through the slot in between the different portions of this tube, I think you could, um, rather than people actually wearing this mirror contraption when they're in it, some of these windows, some of these pillows could be two-way mirrors, one-way mirrors. So at night you get the lights, in the daytime you get kind of this very collaged view of the city where some are open, some are closed, some mirror you, some, some are mirrored to the people outside. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really nice project. The presentation also really explains it very well, I think. I, I, even if you hadn't been explaining it, I, I can get it just from your images. Um, and then just one last thing, you know, I've, I've seen you as a student of yours since, since design one, and I, you know, the, the growth that you've made through, I know a lot of hard work is just really exciting to see. Um, so congratulations. Thank you. The, the other thing that I think is helpful and, 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 uh, one of my students did it uh, yesterday in my, in my studio review is that to, to have a, 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 an image that has the, a summary of the project in, 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 in one single image because it sometimes it's good. I mean, when we're trying to re, re, remember those physical walls that we had in front of us with multiple drawings that we can go back and forth and see it and summarize. And sometimes when you end one image, you say, can you go back to that one, that one, that one? So if you have six images there, even with that animation there, is, is, is a very good way to end reviews. I think I'm going to, if we continue with this type of reviews, I think I'm going to specifically ask that to students because sometimes it helps to keep the conversation uh, without having, you still may need to go back to one or two, but I think having this summary of six that you can see very well, especially after you have seen them one by one, I think it's a very, it's a smart thing that you, you did. Mm -hmm. I think it shows yeah. also one of the issues that I think Amber touched on in terms of the the entrance and the way you are in mind that that penetration on the on the lower left uh, image. It, it looks like that's not as uh, as clearly resolved in terms of this interaction of the second floor or the ground floor. But I can imagine that easily, you know, added to your you have more time how to get in, how to perforate, how to interact. Do you enter in between the, the 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 joints of the panels, like in the section in the upper left uh, uh, corner, or do you penetrate the way you have it in the lower level, uh, lower drawing? I don't know. There are many ways to do it. I think that that's something that you didn't have quite time to enter, right? Because this is a you know an extruded build building that is you know wants to be accessed from the ends, but then when you need to enter from the side, I think that the slots in between the modules it will be a natural place to to go in. But the the potential exploration of how that skin can be more transparent, more open, more you know different levels of uh, opacity could be an interesting uh, layer of to the investigation of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. It's been a pleasure to see this develop and uh, all your hard work is really, I think, paid off in the end. And the discussion of the details and, you know, more of more tectonic uh, design work is because you've investigated this to such a degree. So I really appreciate it. Congratulations. Appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Amir. Okay. So we have one more project in this session. Um, Anna, are you ready to share? 
Yes, I'm ready. Let me share my screen. Okay. All right, that's showing up? Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so like she said, my name is Anna, for those of you that don't know me. Um, so my project ActiveScape is about reshaping a contemporary picturesque through responsive architecture and social invigoration. It takes form as an event series along um, a lifted path, harnessing in on this um, connection through physical activity and through technology. So concept, it sort of began as this idea of adaptability of a kit of arts to respond to user activity, honing in um, on the characteristics of inflatable changing architecture that one could interact with and that changes along the landscape. So it packed in these little parcels of activity and playfulness and begins to speculate on a different type of theater typology with these amoeba bubble programs. Um, looking to some precedents, which these were actually feedback from Mr. Rosner from our early on concept review, but uh, I think the work of Archigram began to influence my concept with its um, temporal and playful nature. Um, and we can see these balloons start to take on a new role of lifting the trail in ActiveScape rather than um, holding the tarp um, to cover the instant city like seen in the precedent. Um, and I also looked into the work of Shumi in Parc de la Villette. And I think it gave influence to my design in the way that it uses a series of events intervened into the public park and waterway. Definitely some similarities in regard to the site conditions and user interaction. Looking back to um, our assignment to the apparatus, Tanache and I um, created this apparatus that focused in on technology and our dependence on phones. So essentially this apparatus at um, the table at dinner and each person places their phone in the holder and then whenever one person lifts their phone the balance tilts and drops marbles into these bins so maybe like after dinner whoever has more material in their bins would be the ones like pay for dinner or something like that is sort of how we pictured it um but an important thing to note is that if both people lift their phones at the same time it stays balanced and um this was important because we don't think phones are all bad yes they can disconnect you from being present to that, which is immediately before you, but um, they also have an important role in connecting you with people um, that aren't with you. And I think this started to become even more important and relevant as we started to see social distancing and more of a reliance on technology. So uh, these technological, technological influences are what began to drive um, another aspect of the contemporary picturesque and were an influence to the cybernetic theater that we'll see later. So looking at the project more holistically, the site plan was sort of just meant to locate us on the trail and call attention to how um, ActiveScape becomes an extension of the existing trail and a connecting point for people coming from all different directions. And all these points to the trail. And here's a sweet view, a sweep through video. My hope was to give sort of a better understanding of the project and how it sits along the water's edge, sort of lifts off the ground and becomes a place ready to swarm with activity. Um, and the closing shot shows the cybernetic theater that I'll go into more detail about. As a program diagram, we can see some of the different activities ranging from sports to theater, to cafe, to garden. Um, I see these events as programs and the activation of the landscape and diverse amenities that um, I really believe the trail could benefit from. And they sort of um, hold up the path like we saw in that video. Uh, now I wanna call attention to the um, theater portion of the trail. So this portion adheres to the field condition of activity with um, the embedded large theater program within the trail and it utilizes the original apparatus in the cafe space on the right um, that sort of registers that as its own event um, with the use of apparatus version 2.0 over on the left it has a unique feature that engages in the digital 
um, contemporary culture that is using their phones. So this device uses the cybernetic implementation that considers the user actor network um, and how individuals can determine their own outcome in these theater events. And you can see a little bit more of that in section. Um, you can see that with this apparatus, people aren't sitting, they're active and on the move along this trail so that when they enter the theater, they're standing and engaged. Um, there's a stage that could be water or it could be solid. Um, and a membrane like enclosure. The wall system is composed of these inflated air capillaries. It is rigid yet flexible and organism like. We also get a better understanding of the cybernetic influences where users get to use these phone stands um, to determine the events, like using the openings in the skin to let light in um, or keep it closed. So there's, they get to sort of determine that. Um, and I wanted to create a couple anima animations to show different um, interactions along the site in different um, parts of the programs. So this one highlights more of the active nature of the project. Um, I focused on the kayak and canoe area where we see a guy and his dog engaging with the technology and the um, event that that fosters within the landscape. And I also created one of this um, pet area. So the idea was another take on the apparatus combined with recent ideas and implications of social, social isolation, having an architecture that can respond with these needs without becoming obsolete. Here the um, amoeba bubbles can be uh, an open social space or have walls or tracks that socially isolate people and allow them to be in these individual pods where they can be on their phones. And in this perspective, um, I wanted to feature more of the activation of the site and engagement with the lake in downtown. I think Town Lake Trail is an important distinguisher in Austin amidst this downtown urban fabric. People get outside and get moving. And with, while being outside, it still has a sense of interior space and you can imagine it buzzing with people. Including with this perspective, I thought it was important to show the use of the project at night considering how it can work alongside the existing site condition and activities like, with activities like concerts and facilitate new nighttime activities along auditorium shores while still being experimental and extending beyond normative architecture. So here's some thumbnails. If you want me to go back to any of the other drawings, just let me know. Sorry, Anna, can you explain, um, uh, there's so much here to, uh, digest. Can you explain again the relationship between the the assembly that you made in assignment two and it shows up again and again um, primarily at the theater? So what what is it doing again? Yeah, Checking in so, and out? Um, here. Plan. Um, so the original one is what I place in the cafe where the phones are connected to this holder and um, and this was just sort of a version 0.0 of that, of the phones along the stand in the theater where they're standing. And the idea of the cybernetic theater and that they can be using their phones to um, maybe like send in things that will change the outcome of the theater. Um, or like in section where you could see that little um, thing in the skin that could open up and let light in, if that makes sense. Okay. So the stations are sort of like the drive-in movie theater where that's where you can hear like the sound, but it's also in your version, a way that you can interact with the performance. Yes. Okay. And so when it moves through the site and we see it um, later on near the kayaking station and so forth, is that just an indicator to us that it's a, a, a point at which technology and interaction and maybe even like sight and nature are all supposed to be sort of intertwined? Yeah, where they all sort of come together and how it could be used for um, lowering the canoe from how it's hanging right now. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any questions before I start? It? No, no, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, so um, stylistically, it's incredibly beautifully consistent, and I love that you were able to maintain the playfulness of the project um, through this ambient quality without really um, 
relying on someone else's, I mean, it's, it's referential, but it's yours. And I really appreciate that. Um, the, the project itself and its uh, responsiveness um, and through these, this, this one mechanic of uh, inflation, um, I think, you know, it's, it's totally embracing that speculative. Um, it's, you know, it's, again, relying on your precedents, but you're making it your own. And I think it's quite uh, stunning. Um, the relationship between technology interaction and the physical environment, I think in there is something really um, provocative. And yet uh, you have relied maybe too much on that move-in, uh, drive-in movie theater sort of precedent, like the idea that there has to be some kind of stand in order for that interaction to happen um, is somewhat antiquated. I think even now we see a kind of interaction via the phone and that's right now's device for that kind of thing. Um, you probably don't need that. The idea that there's plugs everywhere, I do kind of like because that's <laughs> one kind of antiquated thing um, that we find we're always sort of like searching out. Um, so that aspect of it, I appreciate uh, a lot, um, a kind of functional need uh, that's often overlooked. Um, but that the, the desire you have for in exploring the relationship between our reliance on this device, right, which will evolve, the technology will evolve, um, and the physical environment, and then you know, ultimately whatever that comes to, and like as like this technology evolves into augmented reality, and and so forth. So that you know what you might be actually suggesting is that there may actually be a whole other layer of this project that exists only, and we can only see it through some kind of device. Now, right now, that might be like. Pokemon Go on our phone, um, mm -hmm. but I would like to think that that will advance so that you know this isn't such an awkward relationship. And I think um, maybe in the awkwardness of those stands, um, we're sort of addressing that the technology will always change. You know, it's like dead phone booths in um, in old buildings, or even like the the um, cable jack. Sometimes, and if you move into an apartment and you never actually get cable because you don't even have a TV sometimes. Um, you know, when we accommodate the technology of today, it's always going to start to be outdated. And so I think the idea is great. I think um, it, it's, your speculation on this point is sort of falling short. But overall, beautiful project, beautiful presentation. Thank you. Just to, to follow on that uh, comment, because uh, I thought that it was uh, interesting. I think that in a way, what uh, um, I don't know, maybe that's the intention, but what Anna was uh, 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 trying to do is to, because I think that the, the idea is that that space is for whatever device you have, right? So you, you, I think that the assumption that everybody brings their own device is just like marking the spot, almost saying, hey, we know that you come with this. You, you're going to you know, go to a restaurant and there's a place for you to put the phone and, and I know that the phone may change. I have the theory that it's not going to change that much. I mean, I look at my my MacBook Air, and you remember remember when the computers used to change every six months? The design was so different. And I always say the Mac, MacBook Air. At some point, they say, "Look, we cannot get it any better." So the, the 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 memory may increase, but the design is exactly the same in the last three that I have had. So at some point, I think that those things are maybe. Technology is always ready to surprise us, but I think what is interesting is that she marks the spot of saying we're going to we're going to have that sense of the way we are going to occupy this space is based on where this piece of technology is going to reside, and that's that's this little stand. So I think it's, it may be antiquated, but it, it feels like it's antiquated in a very uh, interesting way because I think that it, it makes almost like. The, the grid is based on you know how these people are going to be and i can't imagine that you do the same thing for a cocktail party where everybody's standing up and then you have more concentration of like high tables for this type of device or is more like social distancing arrangement and everything could be about where these devices go so i think it's a, it's a it's an interesting it's one of the many layers that you have i agree that you have a lot of richness in the project 
I think it's uh, uh, interesting how it ties with the technology in general. I think that's one of the things that this fund Palace and Cedric Price, I mean, one of the things that I take away from it is this excitement about technology and how it can be used to, to create this uh, excitement, fun, whatever is the word, uh, 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 places that can be adapted to specific circumstances like this park. I think that the narrative is very well developed. I mean, I think this would serve you well in general with any project, but it looks like this project needed to have a very well explained story. And I think that you did that very well from the precedence to the initial diagrams. I love the initial diagrams of the of the animation at the beginning of how these, uh, these balloons can lift these uh, walkways. That's the only thing that I would say that when I look at everything, the only thing that I would say is that those could have been rendered lighter. You know, it feels like they're a little heavy, heavy handed still in terms of like, and I know that sometimes they go over the, these uh, amoeba like structures and they could be a little wider, but in general, I feel like the, the ratio of these balloons to the, to the paths could have been a little, you know, the paths, the elevated paths could be lighter, feeling lighter, and also the, the balloons a little more, uh, present uh, in them than like a little bit not as much as in the initial diagram but otherwise i think it's very well thought out project and it brings out a lot of interesting issues and and uh you know good job congratulations so um i i i agree and i mean uh, that first image where you show the balloons pulling the path up i thought i mean right there i was kind of like oh yeah this is this is this is good. I want to see what happens. And um, just, I, I do think the, the presentation, the drawings are really beautiful and very seductive, joyful. They have a playful um, quality to them, but they also do a good job of explaining your project. Except I did have, I was confused by the theater as well. I was confused about how that was operating and what the little stands are doing. Um, unlike Juan, I do think phones are going to go away at some point in our lifetime. I think, I don't know what they're going to be substituted with, but I think it's going to be something more attached to us in some way, but who knows? So, um, mm -hmm. but I did think even if you were setting it up the way you have it, you've been, re you've rethought so many things. It seemed so odd to me that these stands were so normative. Like, mm -hmm. why isn't there some other thing like this thing hanging from above or something? So even if they were there, it was funny to me that they were on these little, these little um, stand kind of, kind of uh, pedestals. But I do think, um, also I think if you had time to keep going, which is always the frustrating part, kind of looking at the surface of the, of the path of the trail, um, what, what do you see from underneath? Do you feel like, you know, you don't want it to feel like you're under a freeway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here in Austin, like I walk over the, the Mopac pedestrian bridge, it's kind of cool being under the freeway there. So. I think just thinking about each, just going further and not that you haven't already delved into it quite a bit, but it, it's a really beautiful project. And I think like the last one, while it's very different than Amir's, I think it also really hits the mark of the studio, what you were trying to do. Thank you, I appreciate it. And that's very helpful. I think that would be something interesting to look more into the stands and how it would play with, um, the way technology starts to change in the future. Something interesting to look at. That was the one drawing for me too that I had a little bit of trouble uh, just reading what, what I was supposed to read from it. Um, mm -hmm. The performance was so light and uh, not as visible. So at first I wasn't sure what they were looking at or was the performance on the phone? So, or was it something? Anna, maybe a close up, more yeah, subjective second. view of what the performance and that stand are all about could yeah. supplement this in yeah. your portfolio. I think that you've got 
you've got everything already there and maybe that gets teased out just so that the flow of what you're describing doesn't raise questions like it has, because I do think that you've thought it through to a great deal of detail. And um, I, I too enjoy the project overall. And I think that you've been very uh, forward thinking in almost every aspect of the project. So I really appreciate that. And it's another one of these projects that I would love to be a part of. And um, so I really congratulate you. Thank you. I have to say, Danielle, that's something for the all the projects we saw. I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm a big um, fan of the trail and it's kind of a happy place for me. And so seeing these, these projects, like, oh yeah, that would be, that would be really interesting to be, really be there. Yeah, experience <laughs> this. And, and I think just as an opportunity for you guys, the students, to be pushed outside of your comfort zone. Um, I think it's really good. And you may not, you know, it may have driven you crazy during the studio, but I think you'll look back and really see the value of, you know, sort of this crossover from, where does the cross from reality to fantasy occur? and how far can you push it rather than relying. I mean, since first year, we've been trying, working to get you out of preconceptions mm -hmm. day one. And so it's just another push in that direction. Yeah, I feel like Speculative Studio is good at getting you out of that comfort zone for sure. Well, it's also about the imagination. I mean, sometimes we, we, we forget that, you know, having the imagination free to come up with things is sometimes uh, uh, we undervalue the ability for you to come up with things and then say, okay, now let's, let's start giving a sense of uh, coherence to what I'm, what I'm imagining. But uh, you, you started with this, you know, very, well, I don't know how you started exactly, but the one thing that you show us at the beginning is this notion of these paths that get elevated and that's that's coming up from another place than, than, than the normal way that we think about buildings and we think, and I think that is good to invite students to feel like there are many ways that you can arrive to what a building wants to be mm -hmm. and, and the door should be always open for this kind of imagination to, to be there. Sometimes there's no opportunity to do certain things and there are realities about projects that vary from one to another but you know it, it should be something that you should not feel like you're closing the door once you finish this speculative speculative studio and you go into another one and now oh i forget about all those things no this is this is opening another door about what you can think about when you're starting a project it's not only about the final result and the aesthetics of the drawing so the the, the more or less uh, uh, buildable or un unbuildable for me what is interesting is that is 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 planting a seed about how a project can start from another place that is not based on you know a particular program or a particular need you are developing a story you are letting your imagination drive where the project wants to go and that should stay with you guys uh, forever so i think that it's important that you don't feel like oh i'm done with this now back to reality that's that's the the the, the, the worst part you are going to go to projects where you may not be able to do the kinds of things that you were in, invited to do here but there's a sense of you becoming a more mature and aware designer by having more confident in the confidence in how you could generate you could generate a project by having your own ideas about how things should not be the way they always are you are imagining different worlds imagining different things and that to me is, is what this speculative studio and the way danelle has framed it around this idea of fun technology a place that is very close to all of us so it's combining a very real place that is approachable and easy to visit every week well not not the last few weeks so <laughs> well now you can go joyce in the same direction you just need to run no, you don't want to go you don't want to go yeah. i've tried it yeah, no one's I, I, following I, the one way yeah i don't i don't <laughs> like that idea either but uh yeah, because all of a sudden you run with someone that is at the same speed and you can maybe like for a mile running next to each other. So There's too many like, people you know, there. 
Yeah, I like the use position of like something that is a very real site with a very open-ended uh, approach. But the notion of this fun and and the the war even fun palace by itself is just a very evocative way to think about how you can all of a sudden your imagination starts going on just from someone telling you, oh, have you seen the fun palace? And it's like, whoa, 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 what, what, what is the fun palace? It could be so many things that. And then when you bring this notion of technology that I thought it was one of the most interesting thing about the social dimension and the technological uh, aspect of how a fun palace can be somehow combined with these two other parallel ideas. I think that all those things are incredibly relevant to almost any project. So how much of a driver they are for the design of the project is something that obviously is not going to be always the same. But please make sure that you don't close this door. Keep this door always open. You're never, no, you're not going to be able to use it as the main door, but you know you always need to have that option to 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 let that door influence your project. So, congratulations, Danelle. I think it was a successful studio. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll save my wrap up comments for it after the next session, but thank oh. <laughs> everybody who presented um, for what Professor Rosner described. Um, it was really kind of delightful to, to, um, to uh, interpret your projects and, and have them presented to us through the narratives that you gave us today. So thank you all. Thank you guys. Thank you, Danelle. Very good. Thank you reviewers. Excellent comments. We really appreciate it and your support. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Have a good rest Bye. of your day. Bye. Thank you. Nice, nice Bye. To meet nice you. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too, Amber. Bye. Bye. Hi, everyone. Great. I'm Maggie. Uh, all right. Can you see those? Oh, so hopefully that um, sort of gives you the background and context. Sorry to interrupt, Maggie. Um, Matt or Francisca, do you have any questions about? Not for now, Daniel. Thank you. No, that was a great. Thanks for that background. That was okay. very, very helpful. So I'm all set for now. Okay. All right, then, Maggie. Let's go. Um, so my project is called Recreation Rouge, Making a Memory of Movement. Um, and it really centers around the idea um, but I guess the concept where the individual's movement um, of the users starts to create form and space. Um, and in, just in thinking about cybernetics, uh, just I, I like the idea of how the ind indeterminacy of um, these individual people, it, it's going to be unique every time. So depending on the person or the time or how many people um, that are moving together, that you can create something different each time. Um, so moving back to our previous project, um, my partner and I um, designed a, an apparatus that was oper operated in the courtyard of Goldsmith. And it involved, um, we designed and sewed these harnesses that are shown um, in the photos of people wearing. And um, they were inspired by um, climbing, rock climbing or um, fall protection harnesses um, and the whole concept of it was to create relaxation in the courtyard. So, um, so the the idea is that you have four people, two people are sitting and two people are standing, and they hook into these harnesses, and then there are loops where they hook onto these ropes or bungee cords, and um, they were all connected. And then in this next slide, you can sort of see from the top. So the rectangle is the um, fountain in the courtyard. And so the, the two people standing are on the ends, and then you have the two people sitting, and they're all wearing these harnesses, and they're connecting to the center block, which we called the console. And hanging from that block was a marker and um, a big pad of paper that when the people would begin to shift and relax and move, um, it would influence not only each other, but then they would also draw and create a record of this movement uh, within this space. Um, so, uh, I think that was all from that. Then just again, the idea that everyone's sort of tethered in um, and moving and creating a, a document of that. Um, so this is a precedent or just a photo that um, I enjoyed and I think is relevant. And um, it's called the bonds of marriage. And I enjoy how um, you see as they move um, both the form and the center and they move the rope um, it influences each other and then it also creates 
um, kind of a, a neat thing in the center. Um, and then more architecturally, um, a, this firm um, did this installation in a big public square in Cop Copenhagen called Under the Pent Roof. And it was basically just this big um, open structure hanging with ropes. And um, what I liked about this um, precedent is that you see the individuals, as soon as the individuals come into the space and they swing or they move and they, they disrupt the ropes, they are becoming, it sort of draws on the whole theater and performance aspect of the studio, um, how everyone's sort of involved and changing the structure as a whole. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, this image I liked, it's the same precedent, um, but it shows sort of the division of the theater space and then the audience. So the audience being everyone in the square and then you, you can sort of see the people within the installation as performers or actors. Um, and I, I just really, I, I sort of moved um, forward with that same idea. Um, so then just uh, moving on, sort of looking urban scale. Um, I just like the idea of looking at each individual as a performer. This space is really charged with a lot of movement, a lot of traffic and a lot of people coming through in different ways, whether it be by car um, or by bike or by bus or whatever. I just like the idea of sort of mapping the individual's movement within the area. And then this was a conceptual drawing um, early on of you have this sort of collage of all these different unfinished um, sort of A-frame house structures, which are sort of familiar to everyone. Um, but the idea is that it's sort of rigid and structural, um, but also still playful. And um, it, it just sort of provides a framework for what the movement could be. Um, but it's also unfinished. We're all familiar with you know driving by um, a development or, or a construction site and seeing um, this sort, these sort of frames that we know will become houses. Um, but then I'm speculating on, you know, what, what if we, um, instead of like the can, sorry, <laughs> instead of being constructed, um, what if the people are, are the ones who finish the building um, rather than the construction? Um, and it's also sort of informal. It's uh, playful and it invokes sort of memory and, and movement um, that we can all sort of tie into. Um, so this is another conceptual drawing, um, thinking about the diversity of programs and what they could look like in the space. How do I reinvent um, these typical things like knitting or fishing or swimming into something that's more performative um, and that's something that creates form and, and space. So you see in the back, the idea is that um, these people are connected to these big, huge spools up top and as they knit, um, they're connected to the strings. So they're creating something, but then they're moving up as they're using rope. Um, and then like the swimming thing, um, instead of maybe floats, maybe they're suspended from the ceiling. Um, yeah. And then, so moving on in plan, um, the idea is that you have all these um, large sort of frame um, structures and um, they're, they're sort of um, arranged in a village setting. So they're right off the lake and um, each one houses a program, but it could also be that everything is sort of um, flexible so that one day it might be one program and then another it's, it's it changes. Um, and it's this is also looking a little bit at circulation. So instead of typical stairs or elevators, um, the X's are spots where you um, can zip line. Uh, the lines are where you zip line from one um, activity to the next. Maybe you come up at you, and the center, sorry, the center um, is the where you come in and then you move around to all the different spaces. Maybe you come in and only use one of the programs. So maybe you bounce around. Maybe you just walk through the bottom, um, but that's sort of the idea here. So um, once we got home um, after, you know, uh, everything got switched with studio, um, I still wanted to build a study model. So I messed around with these sponges and toothpicks and created um, a 3D form of what these housing um, the organization of the, the buildings would be. Um, and I like the, how they're sort of playful in that um, everything's sort of temporary. And, um, you know, there are six right here now, but maybe another time you could construct another one or take one away. Um, 
And yes, that's that. So moving on to program, um, these are just, this is another image of how I um, am thinking about reinventing the program to sort of fit with this theme of um, interaction in theater. So these are some examples. Like with archery, maybe you're shooting things, but the bow is connected to this long string. Um, and as you shoot it, it creates a string across the room. Um, same with some of the other ones. Maybe you're playing um, catch, but it's with a ball of yarn. So then as it, as you throw it, it uh, kind of, it's, sorry, <laughs> it's messy and it's, it's crazy, but it's, um, it's all about creating form with the thread or the string. Um, so here's a GIF of it in action. Um, so people arrive in the center and you use this balloon transportation to um, ride up. And then from there, you can zip across to all the different spaces. And then throughout the day, they become populated with the string. Um, so my, I guess, conception of theater is that once, so everyone, <laughs> sorry, I'm nervous. Um, so you arrive at the space and then you hook into this harness and you're connected with string and you do all these crazy things. And so that once you're hooked in and you're a part of the, um, the, the installation, um, you become an actor, you become a performer. So maybe the audience is the city of Austin. Maybe you're in a high rise um, across the building and sort of as the day goes on, you see um, what, what becomes, what is starts as a blank canvas is becomes wrapped in the string um, over the day. So it's highly conceptual, um, but that's the idea is over time it, it becomes, it, it changes and evolves over the course of the day. Um, and this is just like um, an interior sort of collage of uh, what it would sort of be like to be in there. Um, and yeah, that's all. So Maggie, I want to um, applaud a couple of things that you did today. One was the, your kind of embrace of the uh, Funhouse Palace approach, which is that um, the project is really incomplete unless it's activated by its users. And so that's a really mm -hmm. strong um, element that you've certainly carried through. I also appreciate that you were able to physically model even during the pandemic and that you take it upon yourself to do that. Um, and then I think that your, uh, your graphics in terms of the collage and the way that you activated your drawings um, both through the images you've chosen and also the way that you presented the projects as gifts um, is quite great. Uh, the, the one part uh, where I am um, like, you know, obviously, you know, we as crits, I think just kind of uh, are always just wanting more, no matter what you give us, we want more. Um, but the thing that I am wanting is more from your architecture a little bit. Mm -hmm. I love that uh, GIF where you show how the string is kind of reshaping the buildings. And I know that it's the users themselves that are supposed to be sort of transitioning those interior, I mean, those frameworks, right? The frames are supposed to be are intentionally generic. Um, but I'm wondering if there isn't a little bit of give from the frame. So I think about the, the running one, right? And the idea mm -hmm. that they're running and yet there's not really anything for them to run on. So maybe there's a little bit more of an indicator from the architecture mm -hmm. side on how you want them to be using it because you've choreographed activities for this space mm -hmm. um, that I think result in very interesting products um, or could potentially result in interesting products. And I think you could um, sort of uh, take on that role of architect influencing the activities a little bit more actively yourself. Okay. Yeah, I have a question, Maggie. You were talking about this activation being uh, made by the user and the, the, you said actually it changed through the course of the day. What is the, the time that you think that could be changed? Is that like during the day, during a week? Because during the day is one thing, the temporary part of it could be defined by you and I think was open for you too. How do you see that? Is it going to be something that happened during the day and then the day after is going to be changed or is it a cumulative process? So the day after someone goes up and change or builds up on what is there. You think about it because mm -hmm. it started by movement, form, and space. 
And I, I think your, your presentation was really built on that. Even the first slide, like movement, I was looking and following and, and then you, you end up on, on form and space. I think you, you, you covered that. I just think that there are some links in the middle that maybe I missed them or I didn't get it. Yeah, no, sorry. I, I guess I think um, to answer your question, I, I would envision like each day, I mean, it could be a week, each day or week, mm -hmm. Um, you start with this blank canvas, which is this unfinished frame building. Mm -hmm. um, and then you either arrive at the in the beginning and you're one of the first people to use it um, and interact. Or um, I guess if you arrive later in the day or week, then you would be adding to it and changing it. But okay. um, I guess that's, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's the yeah, idea. It is. It is. Just to think about how it changed in the course of the day through the course of the week, it could be both, right? I mm -hmm. I really appreciate the way you explain it and walk us through the, the project. And the, I'm just now missing one thing. Uh, when you're talking about, I think it was the fourth slide about the apparatus that you're ex experimenting on the courtyard, that one, one person could influence the other, right? So if one mm -hmm. stands up, the other one. How do you see that interaction happening here? Are they connected? If someone is knitting, the person next to it is also affected by the way I'm knitting. So I'm knitting faster, you're going to move up faster? Or how do you see that cause effect on mm -hmm. these on the users? Um, I guess as it stands now, um, I didn't consider as much that part of it as mm -hmm. much as I did sort of making or creating like this memory or um, documentation of the movement. Um, but that's definitely something that I think maybe should be integrated more. Um, it's just not what I focused on, I guess. That's but, fine. But Maggie, uh, uh, if I can interrupt, I thought it, in an earlier study, which you didn't include, you had sort of tested out some things that were like seesaws, you know, like the whole wall would sort of pivot, like there was an Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That was, um, I so guess. there was a moment of that. Yeah, very early <laughs> semester that did. But yeah, it, it, didn't, but it didn't get it didn't get fully carry fleshed out. Forward. But I guess I just wanted to remind you that there were thoughts of that because you had a full mm -hmm. diagram. <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. Continue. That, 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 that's fine. I think, uh, again, the idea of the, the space being activated and changed by the user, I think you accomplished. I thought it could just be extended to a greater um, mm -hmm. greater level. But I, I, I also commend you for trying to do physical models during this time. I think everybody, almost everybody stopped doing those because it's difficult for you to get, but you know, you don't have sticks maybe, but you have sponges and you have the sticks. So it's, it's good that you're trying. Combining the analog and digital, I think is, is a good thing. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Maggie, would you, would you consider this a folly? Wait, so could you repeat that? Uh, would you consider this a folly? I, I, I could imagine an argument that to, ar to argue that it is a functional apparatus, or you could argue it's more of a folly. Um, what, how would you define this? I'm just out of curiosity, and then I have, to, I have a, a couple of other comments. You don't, you don't yeah. have, to have a long answer. I'm just curious what your uh, take is. Um, there's, not, there's not a right or wrong answer either. No, that, that's a good question. Um, I think right now it's it's a little bit more of a folly just because the I mean, the logistics of connecting everyone to a harness or a string or a rope um, and, you know, floating up in these balloons is a little bit more fantasy-like. Um, but I, I tried to make it a little bit where, um, you know, you actually could. You could have a harness and you could have string and, and theoretically it could work, I guess. But um, I guess sort of both. I don't really yeah, I think, that, I think that's probably the right, the, uh, the best answer you could have because I think part of the power of what you've done is you've allowed the flexibility as, um, you know, as Amber is pointing out, it, it, it is activated by the user, much like a Duchamp ready-made, uh, you know, and other artists have made that, made that argument before that the user is what completes the work. And ultimately the user could decide whether it's a folly, if it's something they use functionally or just use in an absurd way, in, in, a, in a way that you couldn't have thought of uh, as mm -hmm. an example. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of the strength of what what you've done, and, and it does it does raise questions of authorship at a certain point. It's interesting how you delineate how how one delineates that in general. And I would say with any piece of architecture, at some point you're giving up ownership and you're giving some agency to the occupant. 
to fit mm -hmm. out certain things. Sometimes that happens in architecture with for just furnishings alone can change the character of a space. And sometimes archite you know, architects and interior designers don't have complete control of that as an example. In your case, you're giving up a lot of that responsibility. And, uh, and so those questions of authorship come into play. And I think that you did a good job of trying to show at least a few scenarios of how it could work and how this framework, the framework is definitely the operative word. You set, up, set in, in motion a framework in which certain things could happen. Some of them you could anticipate, others you couldn't. And it makes me think of the, the idea of in construction when you stub out for something, mm -hmm. which just effectively means that you've created the infrastructure for something to happen, plumbing or other services or structure, and then you just allow connection nodes or points where then one can then integrate into those. A very visible example of this is often in developing countries, you'll see CME blocks where the rebar is coming out of the top of the blocks. And, and that's, it, it sort of suggests the building is never completely complete. And, and there's a beauty in that. There's a beauty in the fact that it's, it's anticipating, it's a, there's an allowance for expansion for whether it's the owner themselves or someone else to be able to allow it to change as needed. And, and there's a certain humility in the architecture of that rather than saying, here's your finite product, here's your masterpiece, take it and plopping it down on the site. And instead saying, this is a proposal that, I, that is a framework for something that can work, but it might need to evolve over time. And let's think about that. And so I would, I would really uh, play that up as you package this and roll this into your portfolio that you're trying to strike that balance between taking a stand, putting down this infrastructure, putting down this proportional framework that you're, uh, that you're in, intentional and serious about to a certain extent, but you're also open to that being met halfway by by the user and so um yeah mm -hmm. i think it's a, a, a strong proposal thanks mm -hmm. thank you maggie uh, i think that you've worked really hard in trying to get at something that's sort of undefinable which is interesting <laughs> and that's what's i think been the hard part for you is that that uh, factor of authorship or agency that we're used to being in full control of, but you don't actually have that set up by your premise. So, so it's an interesting uh, idea and I'm really pleased at your total outcome and how hard you've worked at it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you. Good timing. Okay. I believe Tanache, you're up next. Yes, sorry, let me share my screen. Okay. All right. Hello, I'm Tanache. Um, so my um, project was the vertical city. Um, so I just wrote a short little paragraph here and I'm not gonna read it, but um, the basic idea was about how cities of the future could be changed and shaped um, and made more green. Um, I was really operating a lot under the context of, of climate change and, and just, my personal idea for the, like, like the fact that we need to urbanize responsibly essentially. So I started with this initial concept drawing of just, a, I guess a building that uh, had a bunch of, you know, trees and nature and greenery in it, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and throughout the uh, process of, you know, or the last couple of weeks of the semester, um, it evolved into this, which, um, was my idea of these towers that would sprout out from the earth that would essentially, like the name of the presentation would be vertical cities, like literally cities within buildings almost, if you can imagine it that way. Um, and just to sort of give you a scale of one of the city or one of the city, cities that we'll be looking at today, um, it's a pretty much exactly the same size as Marfa, Texas. Um, and it's like, it's quite big. Um, so, so just starting off with sort of the programmatic arrangement of my building, um, a couple of the things that I wanted to incorporate were to like living spaces, of course, um, specific 
places that would be like for conserving flora and fauna, um, leisure dis districts, and then a bunch of like parks, uh, lakes, farms, pavilions, etc. cetera. Um, and then just also incorporating some of the, uh, the program from the cybernetic theater that, you know, we were sort of start studying throughout the semester, things like the vintage car restoration or archery, um, dance halls, et cetera. Um, so this is the first little render I have here where you have one of the floors that would be, you know, essentially a center for the conservation of nature and, and flowers, et cetera. So you wouldn't really have too many people down here. This would be areas for safeguarding, you know, precious uh, things that we consider precious. Um, the second was one of these sort of leisure dis districts, which were a lot more for the public and people now. And so you sort of see in certain areas, you have like car restoration over here. You have some people swimming, some people practicing archery, yoga, etc. cetera. Um, and then moving on to sort of the, the more intimate spaces, which would be like where people would live essentially. And just sort of seeing how, um, I guess nature sort of is really important to these people and you have this hydroponic system where, you know, vertical gardens, et cetera. And then in terms of just how you would circulate about this giant mass, uh, one of the things I had, or I guess the idea that I sort of went with was this gigantic looping roller coaster almost that would loop around the entire city. Um, I called it the gyro bus, um, but it was really like the co concept is bas basically pressurized uh, air tube travel. Uh, some of the hyperloop, st hyperloop stuff that you see like Elon Musk and them sort of pioneering. Then in terms of um, sort of the structure, I, I spoke earlier about how I envisioned it sprouting out from the earth. Essentially, it's like organic, like superstructure. Um, and as it grew out, it would uh, sort of grow out into this sort of arrangement where you would have some of these larger columns that would be you know purely in compression and then some of these more thinner tensile columns that were acting in um or in thinner members that were acting in tension uh to sort of just work on that idea of tensegrity because i liked the idea of this building sort of being looking like it can't stand uh not to get too much into structure but um still having sort of a structural organization uh around that and then uh, here I did a little floor plan of one of these areas, a really conceptual plan of this auditorium space now where you, you know, people gather to listen to music or uh, whatever it is they wanted to listen to. Um, and then just sort of end on this, um, just again, one of the programs, this, this light show that I envisioned people gathering together to sort of watch the fireworks in the sky and, and things like that. And that is it. I would start uh, by, so first of all, I appreciate the ambition of, of this project and the, the scale that you've uh, tried to take on. And I think that for me, the, the, the primary question happens at the, from the outset, because you, you've described really the, the what you're doing and how you're doing it. But it wasn't as clear as to why. And in, in the paragraph you had at the beginning, you mentioned incorporating the sense of community while urbanizing, which indirectly references an idea of density, right? an idea of increased density. But it's not not really addressed in any direct way, nor to describe why you know why it would be exactly this height. If so, somewhat, somewhat of my question is somewhat of a quantitative one in terms of what's the FAR you're trying to achieve as an example. I'm, I'm not asking you that question specifically. But in that uh, image that's in this thumbnail sheet on the top, the second one, the cities in the sky, suggests a certain amount of these being spaced out as somewhat of the, the tower in the park scheme by Cord. While you're in, and to say the benefit of doing this is that the payoff is X or you know this much open space on the ground that's not touched. That might be one argument. But even still, why this height? Why, why might it not be twice as many of these that are half the height? Or why not twice as tall as it is now? What, what, what's setting this, you know, what are your parameters in terms of determining how far you went with this? And 
uh, it's, so I'll, yeah, I'll just leave that. It's, it's somewhat of a, a well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer that, Tanash, and then we can talk a little bit about it. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. So actually, that's something that um, you're right. Um, if we go back to sort of some of my initial conceptions, uh, when I was talking to, you know, Professor Briscoe, I sort of talked about this world where it's sort of the only way to live now because we've sort of ransacked the surface of the earth, something that I didn't mention and probably should have had a slide to explain. But um, the idea would that would be that like essentially the yeah like the surface of the earth is somewhat in, uninhabitable and so you have people sort of clustering up uh really urbanly um and that was the conceptual idea behind why they're that tall uh etc yeah I, I i still think something there's more there for you to and and we don't have to cover this today, but but I, but, I, but I think that just to strengthen your your premise, the more that you can, this is clearly a you know a speculative and fantastical studio, which I appreciate and I really enjoy. And it, but I, but I also do think it helps sometimes to add some rigor into if you were to, for example, to mm -hmm. make an argument that you're able to fit uh, when you talked about Marfa being incorporated here, that that helped to give some quantitative sense, like oh okay, actually you're talking about almost a whole city. Or if you were to say incorporate all of the greenery from Central Park could be fit into this zone, but now it's a lot, you're allowed to have actual wildlife in this setting by allowing this sectional separation of the different zones and what that might begin to mean in terms of the relationship between uh, humans and flora and fauna, like how those things begin to intersect and plan and its section. And, 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 you know, and so I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of potential with this and uh, and, and, and sometimes it's not as clear as to whether this is partially for display. Like, is it is it partly demonstration to show uh, how the, the fauna, how the wildlife could live in these different zones in, in some ways almost like a zoo? Or is it completely not about that? It's not about even seeing animals, just giving them a place to exist. So I think there's some questions that come up that become really interesting when you, when you push uh, form in this radical way that uh, that that you have the potential to tap into, that starts and, and vice versa. What does it mean to live in this uh, for humans to live in this uh, in this setting, and even even the view in the dwelling, of, of just looking out and actually having nothing to see, no horizon. Actually, you're so high up that you're just looking out to the sky, like being in a plane. Like often when you're mm -hmm. plane, you're above the clouds in the plane, because you're literally right. above the clouds. Right? It's like you're in a plane. What is that like? How does that change the perception if we're now completely removed from terra firma? That, so I, I think it's that's part of the fun and what you should appreciate about the uh, speculative projects is it raises more questions about you know what could this begin to mean how can we start to think about how does it question typologies and push typologies and so I think it's an exciting premise and I think there's plenty more here you could you could dig in deeper uh, to and or just frame a little bit differently as you you know move forward with it so thanks for this presentation thank you. I mean, I too would uh, <laughs> um, appreciate the ambition that's here. I think, you know, there's always a, a danger with doing something like that because it means that everything you only get to touch just a little bit, right? It's so big, there's no way you can answer all of the questions, right? right. Um, and so I also appreciate it when you're bold about how you want to address that detail or that aspect of it. So when we talked about the circulation and you're like, oh, I think it should be something different. So, you know, it it, it harkens back to something that I was uh, describing in the bubble project um, earlier um, that Danae did. But uh, I think, you know, like that is um, a, a, you know, and a really interesting idea about how you move in and out of the space. And so I think in some ways, because the project is so big, some aspects of it are a little bit cursory, um, but I wish that all of the pieces that you did to choose to show us, and you're sort of summarizing them here in this key slide, which I also am grateful for. Um, something like the dwelling looks almost too much like a regular dwelling. It's um, mm -hmm. it's uh, as uh, Matt was saying, it's great that we don't have this kind of like you can't see the other buildings, but beyond that you know, that everything else sort of seems pretty normative. And I would say at the very least, the roof to wall connection, given your idea mm -hmm. about how the growth of structure might happen, 
mm -hmm. um, would suggest that that might be something different. And okay. again, I don't expect you to have figured out all of these things, but with the, the two or three points, maybe, maybe the, the takeaway is when you mm -hmm. have such a big project, focus on two or three points and then look at how those are truly trans transformative. And I think your transportation, potentially your structure uh, are, are there. And then the flora, fauna, recreation and dwelling feel a little bit more like they're sort of Photoshopped in as opposed to truly transformative. Yeah, um, I agree, Tanesh. I have a question. When I first saw the title of your presentation was Verde, right? Yeah. That Verde, like the color, green, or because that yes. was the way I read it. <laughs> that was the way I read it. And then when I start looking at the presentation, what was the most important thing for you when you're exploring? You had all these ideas at the same time or you just were focused on one thing and you thought there are other things that were missing and you start trying to bring them all together because I thought your interest, main interest was like about how you could do, I thought at the beginning be a vertical farm or a vertical garden or, and then mm -hmm. uh, other things could start coming and just suppose then somehow being involved in, into this thing. So what mm -hmm. was the idea? What is the genesis of this? It was probably more about the flora and the fauna spaces. I think those are mm -hmm. what I was really interested in. It was just like sort of landscape and nature but like really high up into the sky. Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. probably what my primary focus was. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that was the thing. With the way I read it, I thought mm -hmm. something else would come. And then I said, I know it's, it's a fauna floor and then recreation and dwelling and then transportation. I agree again, you're trying to talk about so much thing and a, a variety of spectrums and scale that is so different. Yeah. I was thinking if you could cut, uh, tackle things different. So if you want to introduce structure and growth, what if you look at the bamboo, uh, how the bamboo grows, and then maybe the tower, mm -hmm. that, the analogy or the metaphor between the bamboo and the tower, all those things that are still related to their main goal or the, the first one that was interesting you, uh, besides creating, I think maybe sometimes other problems for you to solve, right? Because the transportation itself could be the entire project. Right, you could just mm -hmm. focus on one of these things. Like, okay, I had all these ideas, and then what if I pick one and choose this one and develop that to the full extent, right? Because mm -hmm. then, you know, when you go to the plan, I don't want to see even the plan, right? Because I want to be kept on the main, the main ideas and more general, rather than go to a more standard uh, plan on a very unique uh, tower configuration, the mega tower that is everything is dwelling, has cre creation, still a vertical garden. You know all these things that uh, maybe you don't need to go that far mm -hmm. to try to solve the, the problem. And I agree with Matt that like um, the quality finale is when you compare. Okay, I could house here I don't know, how many how many uh, parks that could give you idea of the scale also that you are um, trying, but also. Also, how you solve other problems that maybe are inherent to what you're proposing, besides going to and trying to create even more problems for you to solve. But thank you. I really, I really like to, to see. I haven't seen your work in a while, so I really <laughs> enjoy the presentation of Floyd. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Just really quickly, if you haven't seen the work of Malaysian architect Ken Yang, I think you would find it mm. inspiring if you haven't seen that, that it does some of what you're trying to do here. And or if you haven't looked at the Ebola competition that happens every year, a skyscraper competition, mm -hmm. uh, both of those, you'd probably just, if nothing else, just find them very interesting to look into those. And then perhaps it might help you think about how you move forward with this and you know, roll this into your portfolio and so on and so forth. Got it. Thanks, Tanache. A really good comment. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tanache. Thank well you, Tanache. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let me see who's next. Uh, Luis. Yes, I'm here. Can you all hear me? We can hear you. Good. Good. Uh, um, I'm not sure I can just stop sharing the screen so I can share mine, please. <laughs> Thanks, man. Uh, share screen. Here. Present. OK. 
okay, you're all watching like full screen mode, or you're watching like that two screen yes. thing? No, we're in full screen. You're you're fine. Uh, my project is named Soto Marino Palace, and this is like an interior perspective I used like to introduce the project a little bit more. This have you well. I think you'll figure it out like later where this view is from, but it's from like Hopefully. the for the like the for this point of the project that goes into the into Lady Bird Lake. But uh, I'll show you later. It's gonna be faster for all of you to watch it. I shouldn't have used that as uh, as a cover. Okay, the, this is the project I did for like the mid term, the, the second project of the semester. Sorry, I built this with two other partners and it was a project that it was like a helmet designed to help you hear better in different ways like the first two options of the drawing are the different listening methods and then the third option the third row the third one is a speaking mode that it's supposed to be to help you speak better and then here it's two pe people using the helmet one is speaking out while the other one is listening to him and this is some of the inspiration I used for this project. Most of it is from an architect from Italy called Carlos Carpa, and also a Mexican art artist that um, he's basically does just sculptures. That his name is Jorge Jaspic. Then this is the actual project. Okay, I don't know if you can see like that. Topest part of the project is where the top view, the interior perspective of the project was taken from. This is the side, how it, the project, sorry, how it's like interacting with the site and he, how it's working with like, how it's going into the lake. This is a, like a closer view of the project. So you can see like where it's actually in the land, what parts of the project are, are into the water, sorry. And then you can also see some people occupying the surrounding areas and the inside of the building as well. Then this is an explain. Okay, here is like where I explained the project, the, the distribution of the project. So in the right, the north, uh, it's the north, south, the west of the project. That is the top part. North, south. Wait, wait, wait. I need to see again to be sure that I'm pointing the right way. Sorry about this. North, south, east. Yeah, the west, sorry. Ah, damn it. The west is our operatics and restroom area as, no, and the rest area, sorry. Then the under, the part of under it, it's also underwater. Well, it's underwater and it's the, Mutual admiration, admiration, restrooms, and mechanical room. Then, uh, damn, what is it happened? Okay, sorry. Eating and drinking. Then in the east side, the it's the drinking and eating area, as well as the cybernetic theater, the storage and restroom, and a more restroom. Sorry. Then this is a section you can see on the left, the west part, the east part of the building. You can see on the like the entrance of the building, as well as the entrance to the actual volume. You can see the top part where it's the, on the left, that it's the eating and drinking, then under it, the theater. Then on the right, you can see like the end, the room of personal admiration on the left. And then on the top part, the section, uh, sorry, on the top part, uh, some people resting and having some, uh, well, sorry, then this is the the floor plan. And you can see the actual floor plan is cutting through the op operatics and resting area, as well as the drinking and eating. And you can see underneath the eating and drinking area, a little bit of the cybernetic theater. Then this is my animation, basically what the project is doing, I have a, well, the, the thing is doing is I have a board noise that goes all around the circulation part of the project. And it, you can 
control the aperture of the Voronoi to control the amount of sun and wind that it's entering into that part of the building. Then this is an interior perspective of the operatics part of the building. So you can see, again, some people using the operatics or the project of the, or the second project of the semester. Then this is like the entrance of the project. I think, yeah, that's it. Oh, sorry. I totally forgot to explain this part. I'm so sorry. Okay, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but on the right top corner image, there is a gallery of the of this art of Carlos Carpa. And sometimes when the gallery is not being used, they flood the gallery. So I was also thinking on doing that with my theater, just flooding the the theater when it's not being used. So then people would have like different options to like when this theater is not being used, the building could be like still being used and don't have like an empty space that is not creating anything. Well, that's a small detail that I liked about the project, but yeah, I think that I'm done now. Yeah. The angled portions of your project, Luis, are those functioning as stairs or are they more? In the section? Uh, in the, well, in the top drawing of what we were looking at just a second yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, this one? Yeah, are those stairs the actual arms that we see kind of in elevation? Uh, if you go back to your uh, culmination slide. Come on. This one, yeah. No, culminate, like your final slide. Oh, OK, sorry. That's OK. Uh, no, what happened? What's happening? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think I think PowerPoint has something against you. <laughs> yeah, it's not so helping in that me a lot. top image. I know you can't tell what I'm pointing at, but I can annotate. On the top one. Okay. I don't think it is, Amber. If you look it's at just sculptural. This okay. part. Uh oh, I think I can oh. That part? You can see. You can yeah. see the staircase in elevation below. Oh, ah, okay. Okay. This so one? These, oh. What are these things doing? Oh, that's just like columns, like just to create like a volume of the space. Uh, let me like to delimitate the space. It's just like a art sculptural gesture kind so, of. Thing. Yeah, it's sculptural. It's not. Yeah, it's not. Formative in any way yeah. Other than that. Okay. Exactly. No, what's, what happened? <laughs> Maybe it's just, um, just leave it on the last. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah but I think I think you can see here it. like this. This is uh, that part that you're sure. watching. What on okay. the other? What the back part? It looks so much. Well, it looks gigantic in either location. Um, yeah, it's also this part. Yeah. I I I mean, you really had me when you said Carlos Scarpa, and I did do that trick where I went and Googled um, Jorge Yazvik because I didn't know that artist, but I really like the images that you pulled up. Um, and so I can totally understand that being a kind of driving factor for your form here. Um, and I uh, commend that. I think it's, they're beautiful. Um, and I think the idea of having this kind of active piece of art in the, in the water um, that, you know, sometimes floods, maybe sometimes doesn't flood. I think that that's a, a beautiful idea. Um, I do think that there is an expectation that the sculptural aspects work a little harder. Mm -hmm. um, and that yeah. they're, they, I mean, they're, they're too big. Um, they would, they would get, you know, like in, a, in practical terms, and I know this is a speculative uh, studio, <laughs> but, you know, they would get VE, you know, they, like, they would be so expensive. But there must be some way of making those things operate a little bit more. You know, maybe it's an, a strange, uncomfortable bridge or something like that. But it seems like that those pieces could work harder. And then, I'm not sure the formal component of this kind of netted ring. 
And I, I like the idea of it going out and into the water and coming back to the land and connecting the two pieces. But why was it important to have both components? Why couldn't you address what you were trying to do here with just the sculptural entities themselves, like coming out of your original present? Mm. Uh, well, there was part of the project that you have like to accommodate a minimum square footage. So. <laughs> oh, you don't want to answer that way. <laughs> I, I was like, I really don't want to answer no, that way. <laughs> but <laughs> if I don't answer, it will be also bad. So. No, yeah. no, but I mean, you've made a fairy. You made a bold gesture. You've decided that this whole thing is going to be covered in this kind of netting, right? Mm -hmm. And instead of say choosing that everybody's going to be moving through these hard rectangular arms, or that you know maybe like thinking about how those two materials are interacting with one another, um, in the in the way that Scar Carlos Scarpa allows for the water to come in. That's you know the organic component. Um, mm -hmm. the active component, and yet it's housed in this rigid framework that's quite, that, that sculptural aspect that you're responding to. Um, and I think also in the work of Jorge Jaspic, he has this relationship between the, the more chaotic material and the more structured and organized and um, abstracted component. And I think there, there's a real desire in your work to bring that in um, and I think you should take more ownership of it, that there is, there is that, um, there is that aspect to your precedence and you are, and there's the potential to bring it in here. Mm -hmm. Wait, I was, I was going to ask you something before I comment. Um, I agree with, uh, what Amber was saying about that third element, the Voronoi that you're explaining and how the perfumatic aspect, the sun and all that, that, um, is not static or it was not static the process of you finding that but it seems to me foreign to everything you have talked i was i was going to ask you during your design process what come came first and what what came last all the genesis was they all come at the same time or it, it seems to me that uh, that last thing seems like the bow well, be honest I think that, please yeah <laughs> The well, the concept idea was three buildings at the beginning. Like it was three ideas. Yeah, it was the floating one, the water one, and one in the park <laughs> before spring break. <laughs> and then after spring break, I just decided to keep with the water part and then make it smaller. So it was, but the Bornoi was always part of it as well as a maybe the. I left structure and section and then i had to add on the right one because even in section when you see how they relate they don't they almost touch but they don't touch how they exist together in the same time i think it's interesting the way you start thinking about the site and going to the water i really like the idea of fullness. Mm -hmm. i'm thinking even that space if floods in could be a, a internal pool, something like that, a cistern or something that, you know, a reservoir of water. It could have a, um, a different function if you're not using, as you said, but that the last, the, the thing that convinced me the, the, the less is the Voronoi. And uh, the idea of, it's, it's okay to have two, two blocks because you are creating and, and maybe somehow extracting and abstracting the information from your precedents, the void and the mass, the, all those were interesting and I think it could it could have explored those more if you're not so maybe worried you're telling me that maybe what I'm saying is not true that you're you have all at the same time but I think the Voronoi of it took no, you a, a lot of time and then you didn't have time to go back to to explore uh, your yeah. your volumes and I think they could be richer you know even changing the the poche space sometimes it could be occupied and one wall could be much thicker than the other it could have something there all that you had in Carlos Capa, Scarpa and also in the Mexican artists that you refer to, I didn't understand the surname, but um, all those are present, but maybe very timid yet on your scheme. Okay, yeah. I think those are some great points by uh, Francisca and, and Amber. And just to build upon those, I, I, maybe, maybe I'll take it from the tack of 
technique first, and then we can talk about design. But it, it, uh, it the, there are there are some interesting components to what you've done, and I think they haven't gone past the idea of being components to being a cohesive composition yet. And I think you're at a, you're at a point where now you could you know lay trace over this and begin to sketch a party and and plan and especially in section uh, you know the seeing the section uh, and and seeing the relationship of what you created for the especially the the subterrain or subwater spaces mm -hmm. and how they do or don't relate to even the geography of the the bottom of the lake uh, and or just the way that any type of a vessel would be in the most efficient form to create <laughs> what you know what that geometry might be how it might be something different than a conventional basement as an example so i, I feel as though uh you know when it comes to that type of composition as well as you know, the discussion about the voronoi and the other uh, components if you stepped back and thought a bit about even just how much of this approach is meant to be stereotomic versus tectonic and the certainly the Scarpa reference is very stereotomic. It's very much about carving the solid and void. But then the, the Voronoi, for example, is very tectonic. It's very much an assembled kit of parts, the way that it, it's represented here. And so I think if you, if you rinse through this uh, one more time and picked up on a lot of these interesting ideas that you have and these, these components and pulled them together to think about how how is this going? Is it, is it tectonic in some points? And it, it, is it going from point to line? To frame, to surface, to solid, and then therefore void, or is it the or is it the opposite? Do the two somehow meet in the middle? And I think that's that's the sort of thing that will help pull this all together, uh, in both in how you really uh, you know, frame it, how you you know refine some of the design components, and then ultimately just allow it to live on in other forms. Since at the moment it's a bit fragmented as has been discussed in a few different ways. And I especially feel that, it's, it, that there's some interesting moments that aren't all pulled together to be one cohesive project yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that if I could I think, one more, we just, could have been totally different. That's true. Just think about how you could connect both volumes under the water, because if you want to be temporal and being sometimes that they cannot use them or you cannot access mm -hmm. them, but then in other parts, you, you could, you know, I think just that platform that somehow connects them, just the third element that doesn't speak the same language. I think we thought of that option in some point of the semester, but I think it was too much or something happened with that option that was eliminated in some part of the design, I think. Well, I, I mean, I think you should hear this because I said that exact thing like a week and a half ago that that when it was introduced it was suddenly like another new thing yeah. and then that language didn't really carry over the language of the Voronoi the language of the mass that was out of the water but you were quite insistent on it not leaving or mod being modified and I think that I can appreciate your conviction with wanting to uh, be true to what you feel in your gut is right. But I also think you have a tendency to be a bit stubborn with listening to critique. And I think that you should be open to what um, what's being said to you in a positive way with, you know, positive, fresh eyes that okay. can transform your work, that you you can be open to letting go of some things that are big moves. Like every, I feel like you have uh, an abundance of ideas, Luis, and I think that that's that's to your credit because to have no ideas is is not what you want. But to have so many ideas is sometimes a struggle or a challenge because then you have to really start to edit down. You have to know how to calm all the big ideas into ones that flow and work well, so that your process has the ability to have the cohesion the composition, all the aspects that have been mentioned to you by each of your reviewers. Okay. Yeah, one thing to think about, Luis, on that point, just really quickly is, if you can get them all to integrate, if you can design to where the, the functional and formal moves and all those things integrate, the success of those go, going forward is much stronger, especially in practical terms in the real world. Because if, 
if these things feel as though they're separate, what will happen when the budget gets tight, which it always does, is they'll say, well, what can, what can we remove? Well, we can just pull off that Voronoi thing and the rest of it's all still there. But if the Voronoi thing was literally ingrained in all of your scheme, as an example, and, and, you, and you would be able to argue, no, you can't remove the Voronoi thing. It's embedded through the entire scheme. The entire logic of everything relates to that. It's part of how this all functions and it works. It's not just an aesthetic ornament. It's very much laced through it. You would unravel the whole sweater if you pull off that top Voronoi piece. It's, so it's, it's a matter of conceptually integrating it, which then ultimately is more likely to integrate it into moving forward into reality. And so those are all, you know, again, really interesting ideas. We're inspired by all of them. And the more you can pull them together and or edit out and edit yourself and say, well, this one, will, I'll try that for a different project in the future. I'll explore that. Either you find a way to pull them all together or you set some things aside. And, and that's just a good thing, lesson to learn as you move through. It's an important thing in, in your academic career. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have any other questions, Luis, or areas you'd like for us to comment on? No, I think it's, yeah. I think okay. that comments or critics were really good and accurate and so, yeah. Thank you. And I, Thank I you, just Liz. also want to commend you for getting through this because he's had an incredible amount of computer issues for the last two weeks. So that was also an added struggle that I think that you are always really calm and dealt with. Uh, to the best of your ability. So really well done. Thank you. Thanks, Luis. Thank you, Thanks, Luis. Luis. Thanks, Luis. Okay, so I think we have Kevin. Yes. Uh, hey guys, I'm Kevin. Um, my project is called Circulate. Um, I was in the same group as Luis for um, the apparatus um, where we uh, had a social study um, of speaking and listening and um, not just speaking and listening, but uh, speaking and listening um, properly um, and um, intently. Um, and we'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, here's our uh, apparatus in use. Um, so this is um, a concept drawing. Um, um, so uh, initially, um, besides the uh, kayaking trip, um, I have not um, gone to auditorium shores and, um, and walked um, on the paths or anything. And part of the reason why I haven't is because uh, getting there, um, especially the traffic on the, the uh, first tree bridge is just a nightmare. Um, so I uh, thought of a way um, that we could get there that um, uh, I could get there um, without having to uh, drive. Um, so that's where um, this idea of a uh, above ground transportation system came into play um, and I mapped out um, a path uh, from um, the site of Torium Shores to um, West Campus um, and uh, decided to um, use my structure as a hub uh, for a series of um, different uh, transportation um, units to uh, go there and come back. And I decided that um, if I'm going to create this gondola system um, from UT, um, why not uh, extend it further? Um, so um, in this concept drawing, I've also uh, included a, um, a gondola system that um, goes to the airport and Zilker Park as well. Um, all three places, um, not only uh, big for uh, tourism, but um, um, big for residents of the city of Austin as well. Um, so this is my ship. Um, it shows the uh, 
gondola systems um, in, uh, in movement. And um, what we have here is a, uh, um, I showed the three different um, types of transportation we have here. So on the ground, um, the base of my structure uh, has these paths that are kind of, um, can y'all hear me okay? It's a little faint. Um, is that better? It's yeah, it's, it's slightly choppy and slightly faint, but I, I, it's we can we can uh, I, or at least I can hear enough. I'm just, just yeah, 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 likewise. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll try to. Okay. Well, um, so yeah, uh, the three levels. So on the base, um, we have um, you can access it um, walking, obviously. Um, the base extends um, with these uh, arms or paths that um, end up connecting to the existing pathways that um, kind of go around um, this uh, part of the site. Um, the intermediate um, tier is these moving walkways. Um, they're also above ground um, ways of transportation. Um, and uh, on the inside, it's similar to um, a moving walkway at an airport where there is a, um, a sort of belt that you can stand on um, that moves you. Um, and that is shown by the uh, these parts right here. You can see my cursor. Um, and these would take you um, across the river or across main roads um, to the south and to the uh, east. Um, and then, of course, on the top, um, we have the gondola system. Um, and this takes you much further than the uh, previous two transportation uh, ways of transportation. Um, and uh, you'll end up at these um, intermediate levels that I've um, called bungalows um, because they resemble um, treehouse uh, bungalow building. So this is a uh, section of the inside of one of my gondola systems. Um, so in here, um, you can see that the floor kind of curves up towards the um, towards the walls, and um, and there's handles on the uh, on the windows. And this is so um, you are meant to lean forward, um, grab onto the handles, and um, um, put your eyes and ears into one of these um, these apparatuses on the outside. And um, essentially, you would be um, plugging out of um, um, of the inside of the gondola and be um, able to hear audio that comes through these apparatuses and um, depending on what you are looking at through these um, um, sort of I can't think of the word for it um, uh, telescopes not telescopes, but um, viewing think, apparatus. Yeah, just like um, it enhances your view and you can look out. Um, and that's where uh, project two comes in is um, um, you get that idea of concise listening. And um, like I said, you unplug from um, uh, the people around you instead plug into um, this resource that you can use to um, learn more um, about the city itself as you um, are in this gondola system. And um, so this is my theater space. Um, and this, and I added it in here um, because um, you will, when you're on these gondola systems, especially going from, for instance, uh, UT, to uh, auditorium shorts is going to be a pretty decently um, long ride. Um, so this is my ground floor. Um, as you can see, uh, it's circular in shape so that um, it's easily accessible on all sides. Um, you can see the paths that extend out to the uh, existing paths of auditorium shores, the walkways. And um, here we have um, six uh, areas for retail or restaurant spaces, um, and they encirculate um, 
uh, four recessed areas where you can sit and enjoy a meal or just sit and socialize with um, with the group. Um, and then in the very center, we have a um, an elevator system consisting of uh, four elevators to um, to be able to get all this traffic up and down the, um, the structure. Um, these would be the bungalows or the, the terminals. Um, on the right side, you can see the actual uh, mechanical system um, and where you would enter and exit via the gondola. Um, on the top left, we have a bar with four uh, recessed booths to um, socialize. This would be a coffee bar during the day to um, so uh, commuters that are going back and forth from work um, can get some coffee and at night um, would be a, a regular bar. Um, and then this is the rooftop. Um, so once you exit the uh, elevators, um, the pathway prompts you to walk forward towards the edge um, where you would run into a plexiglass wall and be able to look out um, at the highest point. Um, and then uh, um, once again, it's circular, so you are meant to traverse around the entirety of, um, of the uh, outside and look at the city from all angles. And then this is a, this is very grainy. I don't know why, but this is a program um, drawing where you can see uh, what activities go on in um, which spaces. And then this is a Uh, Kevin, do you have a, a larger view of the project in which we understand where these things are connecting to in the rest of the city? Sorry, I maybe I maybe the bottom right hand corner is supposed to tell me what that is, but I don't know. It's the airport, it's the campus, it's the park, and then what's the thing in the top right hand corner? Um, the top right hand corner is a uh, Zilker Park. It's um. It's where ACL is held. Um, okay. Um, and how long do you expect that the, the ride would take? Um, however long, or it would take a decent amount of time. Um, the gondola system is mostly for, um, as uh, kind of a tourism or a, um, or a fun thing to do. Um, while the walkways would be more for uh, the commuter. Um, and the viewing apparatus that we're seeing in there, um, when I look through that and I've got my, like, like this, right? Is there something that I'm seeing that would be radically different than, um, uh, I mean, just looking through a window? How is that viewing apparatus? Well, the, the idea itself. is that um, it also uh, narrates for you. Um, you um, look at a certain thing, like when you look at Zilker Park, for example, um, on the handle, there is a, um, a button to press and it will um, tell you more about, um, about the park or about what you're looking at. Okay. I think that idea of narration is really cool critical to this project and it's um I think it could have been a stronger part of your presentation um I would love to know like what that narration would look like I'd love to know how you designed a little bit of that gondola experience beyond just the cab itself um and then I would like to encourage you to think about these video presentations um as a way of telling us a story and I think you started off really strong with the idea that like, you know, I recognize 
um, an issue with this site that I think this could address. Um, and I'm intrigued by that. And then I want you to move it beyond just its um, perfunctory element in which you started to do uh, by making this cab kind of interesting in terms of like it having some kind of narrative to it. But then it sort of drops off and even the way that you're talking about the project got a little bit like, the audio was a little bit of an issue, but I think even more so the, um, the idea of what's critical in your project started to um, wane a little bit. So when I'm looking at the floor plans, they're addressing like, like the like bare necessities, but it don't, I'm not certain that they really considered like how maybe sort of like like a, a traditional gondola might even operate, and how yours is different from that one. So um, I guess what I'm saying is that like it's a bold move. It's kind of speculative. It's interesting. I like the prop proposition, um, but I think if you're going to sell an idea like this, you've really got to think about the sell. Um, and so that's where your graphics are um, in part pretty compelling, but the, the verbal has to either come through in the annotation or it needs to come through in the way that you present it um, audially. Hmm. Hi, Kevin, I have also some, some comments and some of them are already um, been starting to raise by Amber. So the goal itself could be the main thing of your project. Maybe I didn't want even to see floor plans. I don't know if that was a requirement, but you talk about the program, right? The gondola itself could be the whole system. You could develop that, could be, if you talk about adaptive or temporary, that could be the whole thing about the experience, how that change, if you go to one or the other, maybe you have three lines, they don't need to be all the same. Maybe they don't need to be the all the same size. They don't need to have the same material. The design could be different. So that whole experience could also um, be, be explained and conceived just by designing the system itself. And you, you said it, that that was your theater. So you're already uh, somehow managing and, and dealing with the program. So, and then again, you say, well, it might take, I don't go there because it takes a long time. The ride is long. So then we ask you about how long you take from one point A to point B. I said, oh, this is an amount of time. So. Tell me what excites you about this. Why would I go there and not by bus or by driving my car? And then the second, maybe is a secondary system that you have the, the how you call it, above the ground transportation that you have, I don't know, platforms. I don't know if they're like mechanical or not, but there is a time that I think you got, ups, up, I don't know if the obsessive that is the right word, but in a good sense, you got so focused on those then you forgot to develop things at the same level because then the floor plans, it might be that or it might be something else or generic or um, at the same time you have this cupola or dome, but then they're not part of the same system, right? It just bits and parts, they don't speak the same language again. And they, I, I was gonna ask you also, you have color or color code um, cabins or gondolas. I was wondering if that would be something that there were different kinds within the same system or if it's just a way for you to represent because I was always like waiting for that to come. I was super excited when I saw the first rending, the three spots and then the central uh, rotula, like the knee that, okay, everybody gets to a point here and then everybody spreads from here. But then I, I want to start, I want to know, I want you to, to make me to go there, you know? That the color have any meaning besides just a composition on the sheet or an animation? Um, the different colors come from the uh, ability to kind of personalize your own gondola. Um, and okay. it's more evident at night, I suppose, but um, you would be able to um, change like... Uh, did, I, did I miss that or did you say, did you say that or I miss it? No, I, I didn't. I didn't say that. I'm sorry. Okay, good. Because I think that's the thing. You could just focus the entire work on that kind of love. how you personalize, how you can maybe uh, receive different and experience. Because that's, if I'm leaving, sorry, Francisca, yeah. that's the cybernetic theater, and I wish uh, Kevin that you had fully developed that as an mm -hmm. idea. That that mm -hmm. is the the user controlled aspect that gives yep. a performance piece to your project. 
Yeah, and a, and a lot of those um, ideas that I did have, um, such as the light, um, they would be controlled by uh, um, like buttons, really, or or something like something yeah. of the sort. Um, so it was because... difficult for me to try to um, like implement like a sort of button system. Besides, um, say it was on the handles or um, something like that. Okay, but you know. It could be something you could think about. And if I live here, maybe if I go, if you have three types or four types, why would I go there again? You know, if it's about the user, then it's different. I can, every time I go there, I can experience something different. And that could be a rich part of your process that maybe is missing here. Yeah, I'd like to build on some of the points from, uh, from Francisca and, and Amber, I think. So Kevin, I, I think that the, uh, maybe the way that you could present this project and, and, and think about it as you move forward is, or, or maybe just a way I would have found it more powerful, which I think is, or is, is something that you've perhaps thought about, uh, at least indirectly, if not directly. But if you were to make the argument that uh, transit and transportation and movement is just a, an aspect of uh, or, or that we're moving a and we're moving in that direction as a culture to where there is there's there's just transience that happens and in, in different types of movement and, and, we, and we can find a way to design those spaces in a meaningful way that could be a very pow powerful powerful premise uh, in the film lost in translation for example mm -hmm. that is those things. But the whole idea is that everything is happening in some form of transit, you know, and the protagonist is, you know, whether it's in a plane or in a taxi or an elevator in a hotel room, those are often spaces that we think of that that's not real life. That's when we're between the rest of our life. We think of commutes. When you're in a commute, you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm just waiting to get from point A to point B. But that line between those points is not meaningful. It's not a meaningful space. It's just you're, you're either just walking or, or, or cycling or in a car or a train or bus, whatever the case is. But if you were to say, what if we can celebrate those, those spaces, those, those moments, uh, those transient moments? And then what if you, as, as a way of designing that, if your metric became time, if you thought, how do you measure something? How do you measure a space? And it's the units of time. How much time are you spending there? And therefore, that determines how you scale the space, how you determine how that drives the scale, that drives the form, potentially based on how much time you're actually spending in that space. And so as I, as I see this array of these different zones, whether it's the retail spaces or their gathering spaces and the gondola, I start thinking uh, there could really be something profound if you begin to try to embrace the fact of that these are moments of transition. How do we make them something other than the predictable uh, pod that they might be otherwise, and you've started to do that in some ways, but in other ways have, have, have stopped shy in terms of thinking of it as something that can really transcend that, transcend that. But I think that's that's the crux of the project and the power of the project is if you were to say let's let's embrace transit, let's 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 make that a space. Let's make the entire network is spatial, every single aspect from point A to point B to point C, and all of these different types of things. Uh, so that, that's something I think, if, if nothing else, could be part in the way that you, again, frame this uh, going forward, but also something to really think about when, uh, and, 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 you know, circulation is, is, an, is as old of an architectural problem as any. And in this one, if you say the project is about circulation, that that's it, and then ev everything else is, is secondary, that's, that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you, could, you, you should really em embrace that um, as part of as part of the whole project. Hmm. Thank you. No, I agree with that. I think these have been really good comments for you to hear. And I think that maybe some development in, in our trusting that the gondola can be your theater and it can be your architecture and that's worthy of your investigation rather than defaulting to the floor plans, I think is, is something that you should consider as a continual uh, pursuit. Um, I think we're out of time for this uh, review, this part. So I think we should move on. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Um, so we have one more. Alex, are you you here? Hi. Yes. Hi. Good. Hey, Alex. 
Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I'll share my screen. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Not yet. Oh, not yet? Yes, here you go. Okay. So this is the Fun Palace 2.0. Um, I really named it the Fun Palace 2.0 because I wanted to get at the ideas of Cedric Price and uh, this, I, these ideas of uh, change, interactivity, adapting to our current situations we face in life. Um, and this performance aspect that he put with, so this is why you see all these performing, performing people um, uh, universe, I guess that you can call it. So, okay, so I'll read this little blurb I made. So in a forever changing society, there needs to be a place for reflect the time. The Fun Palace 2.0 is boundless and able to infinitely adapt to the changing demands of society. Um, so social distancing is a change we are getting accustomed um, as of the last few weeks, and within um, the program for the Fun Palace 2.0, uh, we see some of these adaptations that we're facing. So it's kind of adapting to this current situation, even though I see this structure is adapting to anything that it might be faced with. Um, so the study model that I made uh, before break, it's kind of showing, it's more rigid than I wanted it to be, but it's kind of showing um, my initial thoughts. Here's this GIF I'm making. So going at this social distancing aspect um, and really taking in this change and showing how the structure can move in many different ways. Uh, I wanted to start with our apparatus that we made from our assignment too. And it was really about um, communication between two people. So we have two, three, four, whichever amount of, I mean, limbs that you need to put this on. Um, and it's attached to each person and it's about working together and um, moving and seeing like, what you can do with this apparatus on you. And also tying in this distancing aspect that at the time was not really applicable, um, the social distancing, but I think it kind of played out in a way that to our advantage. So just this apparatus and showing how you can communicate with the other person and the distancing is what I want you to remember. Um, this visual is showing this movement that can happen and showing something like a little hint in our in my further slides, uh, what will happen in the spaces and how social distancing affects the structure that um, Palace to what I was um, trying to convey. So this is a just visual, I, like a visual. I want you to get into the project and see um, the full view of the project and show all these movable elements and everything that could possibly happen in the Fun Palace 2.0. And it's showing, you can see these little pink um, separators showing kind of how the structure is taking from the apparatus showing the social aspect in a lot of ways. And this is more of a fun thing to do. So this is a little of detail, I'll call it an orb. And this is a little detail. The big thing in the Fun Palace was with Cedric Price, he wanted to fully realize his ideas. He definitely and the future of things. So I, he had some next to the theater it was that was just and to show like a show something, a little these orbs, these movable structures can be actually realized in the future at some point, maybe. Um, this is another visual showing this movable nature um, of the project and showing how uh, this is the apparatus on the people, by the way. But this is showing how the programs can be influenced and how 
each movement can influence the people inside for the structure. Um, here's the plan. And I'm really thinking of this as not a solid plan or something that's not movable or changeable. It's not rigid. It's really just more of a snapshot, maybe a snapshot in time or a snapshot in maybe some day that the structure is in this position because it's definitely a changing thing um, that could move around infinitely. And here's another snapshot a section detail that's a section that's showing all the interactivity that could happen within the space. Um, I think uh, here's a little performance piece. Anything that could possibly happen can happen in this piece. And it's not completely showing the social distancing aspect, um, but it's really just showing this interactivity and all the things that could happen within the space. Um, there's another visual showing just how this social distancing and how the actual structure is influencing um, the program. So this is maybe an observation that I'm looking out onto the river or the lake in Austin. And this is showing just what if we had to separate all the time. And it's another thing in addition to a map of this program or kind of a performance setting that shows you what could happen if social distancing is um, kind of played out and is a thing that we have to live with. And it's showing how structure um, continually like, is adapting to that. And for this last visual, visual I am focusing on this cybernetic theater, this performance um, area that's, that has the apparatus um, and it's just showing the things that, I mean, it's just showing the theater space and what a space would look like with this apparatus being used in it. And so I will go to my last slide. That's the final slide. Danelle, you're muted. Okay, yeah, I thought this, I thought you had a thumbnail page. Thank you. Oh, yeah, this is it. Okay. So, uh, Alex, is, is this, is your project, would you describe it as a, uh, somewhat of a cynical project? Is it it's almost a cynical critique of social distancing? I guess I'm trying to get a sense of, it's almost as if I'm, I'm asking a question somewhat and then it's, it's, uh, and then so I guess I'm, uh, you know, showing my cards a little bit in terms of, to a certain extent, I kind of I kind of see it a little bit as taken to its logical extreme. This is what could happen with social distancing, and it's unclear. Or actually, I just I, I my my interpretation is that it's generally you know it's, it's somewhat of a cynical take, showing as opposed to showing here are all the great things that can happen and these great experiences and different vignettes of moments. Um, maybe if you could just speak to that really briefly. Um, I think it's, I think it was more a, of, it was more of just a structure that, had, that could change in many different ways. And what it was faced with at the time, at this time is social distancing and it's adapting to that. I, okay, that, that I think, uh, yeah, I, I guess that maybe is, uh, because I, I, and I'm even thinking about how projects live on, especially for final reviews. I, you know, I think it's always disappointing when, when you get to a final review and, and you get all this feedback and it's like, well, now I have no time to respond to that. So I often do talk about how things get packaged into a portfolio, how they live on, how you grow from this to the next project. Uh, you know, we don't know, of course, how, uh, what the long-term impact is of our current situation. It's, it, it certainly won't be very brief, but. Uh, I'd hate for your project to be dated is, is, is part of what I'm thinking, because I think the potential does go beyond that. And I think what you just said there speaks to something larger. And so I, I, I think that the, what you have very loosely in the beginning 
is the premise of, of a, a structure and framework that can flex to allow different things. And I would suggest that when you do have time to think about an alternate scenario, what's an alternate scenario where this structure uh, is represented experientially and perspectively similar to what you have at the end currently to show another scenario of how this accommodates that rather than just in a section diagram or a, a plan diagram. Uh, because the, the, there, there's, there's something about it that comes off, uh, again, as more of a specimen, this apparatus, rather than being a, a, an actual spatial, uh, something that has spatial ramifications. And uh, and, and I, I'm trying to think about there are, there are plenty of things in architecture that relate to this premise, this idea of distancing. And if we think about the notion of offsets, we, we you know, and, and that happens even in the code, we have offsets and buffers between one site and the next. There's a reason why we have those things to allow for other things to happen. We have a right of way where you're supposed to have a sidewalk off the street in between the street and between the building. Um, we have easements that are similar. And, and th there are different ways that we actually have that that I hadn't really thought about it, in, in terms of this distancing until seeing your project that I think could be quite powerful. And so I'm wondering if this even could have implications into how we think about physically manifesting uh, form-based code. If you imagine this, this one of these apparatus sitting on a site that can begin to flex and sort of shows the maximum envelope that you could build on a site, for example, and begins to speculate in those types of ways. I think there's a lot of potential to this and, and part of my comment is just thinking of, again at how, how you can make sure it's not dated and doesn't come off as this one-off thing that worked for this era. And then as soon as this is all lifted, <clears throat> that the apparatus you know, suddenly isn't as powerful. Mm -hmm. I yeah. agree. Just, just on that, I, I had a little bit of trouble um, on the audio. So I think I missed some parts and, and forgive me if I'm gonna say something that you already said, but I couldn't hear you. So. Do all the are all the nodes operable? So all the spheres that you have, I think you call it ping, the balls. Are yeah, they all the operable? Mm -hmm. Yes, they will be all operable, and it's just something that these little so, are attach and reattach kind of. Mm -hmm. So that what I thought. I, I was just not sure. So I think you come to a point that your system is able to do almost anything. So. Is flexible enough and is able to adapt to different circumstances. So it could be a site that is different. For now, you are working on a site that seems to me to be flat, and then you're creating a secondary system when you start placing uh, planes just to, to create the space, right? So what if you start mm -hmm. thinking also that system at a different scale that could create a secondary tertiary system that itself create that? So you don't need maybe to have the platforms, maybe the stairs could be, you know, I, I, I understand what it did. I'm just also, as Matt was saying, thinking about what it could be in the future if you have to work a little bit more on that system. So I remember one of the, the themes was about adaptation and flexibility. I think you got it. I was just thinking if just with its change in skill and of the, of the members of the elements that you could uh, achieve in a greater, a greater flexibility and accommodate differently other requirements that could emerge from a different use of that uh, same system deployed in a different circumstance. Um, is, is there ironic enough that you are thinking about this apparatus uh, before pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting yeah. that it was very actual that then you use that for a, a, of what you call our new normal, right? I was also thinking if you, again, I might have missed it. Do you think about that length or the maximum or the minimum relate to the, the, the restriction that you have? And are those relate to the, the size of the members or do they have any parametric relationship between the length of those members with the, the length or the, the dimensions of your actual members for your system? So you have a minimum and a maximum and also could relate to the code. Did you think about that? Are they really related or not? I think they could definitely can and uh, kind of compress in a minimum maximum way, um, but not really beyond that. Mm -hmm. Just being able to move and be placed on different orbs. Mm -hmm. I think um, that said, as I said, it's fully flexible, but you could also introduce some constraints. Yeah. That you can move that amount, but you cannot go beyond that maximum and minimum. That could be interesting. But overall, I think it's 
the drawings, you know, I couldn't hear most of your presentation, but the drawings um, raise those questions, but they are clear. It's easy to follow and to read. I was just hope I could uh, have heard you. Yeah, I wasn't sure if anyone could hear me at all, so. <laughs> Yeah, Alexander, I think it speaks volumes about your project that you were able to communicate, even though the audio was pretty garbled. Um, but the drawings that you created here are so compelling um, and fascinating that uh, it's really engaging and I want to look at them um, and try to figure out what's going on. And I think that's a huge uh, battle, uh, even when we're not just doing video conferencing. So kudos to you for that. Um, I also think that your project is a kind of celebration of how exaggerated detail to one, exaggerated attention to one detail can actually really drive a project. Um, so you have this, this idea about this node, the node is um, how all of the spaces are theoretically created. Um, but then I do totally agree with Francisca that I am frustrated by the translation of line into slab and then that being like considered space. Um, and we have this kind of diagram in the bottom left hand corner where the idea of what space is and even the one in the middle at the bottom seems to be much more shifty than just a flat plane. And so mm -hmm. when I see the flat plane conditions um, and I see your apparatus, right? This mm -hmm. stick thing um i there's i have two frustrations one it looks too normative for such a cool idea and then two it, to really kind of carry this forward it seems like you know even the connection between people should be somehow made uh with your orb detail and so instead of it just being like these like like literally what you created in assignment two with these kind of straps and the stick, right? Like imagine that every time you're within six feet of somebody, like it becomes this kind of sticky orb thing. And like everybody's sort of like connected to one another and whether that's an actual physical object or whether that's something else, I don't know. But that's an interesting way of um, translating what I think you're trying to do here, which is position this in a specific time and place and adapting to that but also think about it as like in, in its general con, uh, condition as well. Um, so you know, on the one hand, really, really like the graphics of the presentation. On the other hand, um, somewhat frustrated with the architectural reliance on slabs, but um, all in all, like uh, visual presentation was phenomenal. I really agree with you on the slabs. I think that's another detail, like the orb that could be worked out, like, mm -hmm. like a, something that could extend and fold and I mean, spin around anything, um, maybe yep. a with more time, you know, that could be worked mm -hmm. out. Well, and I like that you, like, I don't know how this is gonna work, but I have this idea of this material being something that could be existent in the future. And I think, you know, right now we think about all of our construction materials as primarily uh, rigid. Um, but if you were to think about something that's more flexible and that could enclose space and be rigid when it needs to be rigid and not rigid when it, you know, like if you use that same kind of application, um, that could help solve that problem. Um, but I do, I mean, I think for the scale of the, uh, in terms of time uh, of the project, um, I think, you know, that one detail is really quite, quite nice to move forward from, but yeah. That's great. I, I agree that it's a very provocative project, Alex, and I've enjoyed seeing it progress through the situation that we're in currently and that it is timely that for me, it doesn't need to have a, an existence or a narrative of what its future is or might be. It's just a story of what is relevant or current right now. And the research itself, I think, has promise. For, for future projects, but this to me encapsulates um, a story of, of where we are. And I mm -hmm. don't see it as dystopian or, or cynical. I actually kind of always imagined it with you as somewhat of a reality that is, is, uh, is what it is. And um, I think that there are uh, areas of, of grayness that could be further explored. Um, but I do, I do like that you allowed yourself to imagine a world or to, to depict a scenario of space that um, confronted, confronted where we are right now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if uh, there are any other comments for Alex or any closing comments, I think we're getting close to the end of this session. Um, that's, we have a little well, bit of minutes. I think it's interesting knowing if I go, if I can go first. Yeah. So I think it's very interesting knowing them since first year, all of them found a way to rep to have a, their own language and to represent their ideas and thoughts in a very, most of the times a very different manner, what I think is very, very interesting and makes the studio very rich. Um, the, the project we're all thought to, to, through, and I really want to congratulate you on that. It was very uh, joyful to look at all the drawings and they were beautiful and clear and was very, very um, rewarding for me to look at those projects today. I think we all learn from you and from your ideas, thinking about not even on a time frame that you are all at home and isolated. And um, that was very interesting to see what the overcome of that was. And I really want to, to congratulate you. I think I just said, but I think it, you, it is, you all deserve it. It was very, very um, good to, to be here. I thought you enjoyed the semester, although all the new realities, I think you all had joy working through these projects. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you guys should all thank your professor for the coolest site visit method ever. That's pretty awesome. And I'm so glad that you guys were able to do that um, before social distancing took effect. Um, I think that um, the video conferencing really requires you to all think about how you present your projects in, and we use this word narrative. I think we expect from a 2D, like moving screen, that there's really gonna be a story. You know, this is how we, this is television, right? Um, so I really think it puts an emphasis on that narrative. And one thing that you guys did that I kept responding to again and again and again was the gifts or the gifs. I don't, I really don't know how to say this. Um, I know it's a big debate, but anyhow, um, keep import incorporating those into your work and make sure that um, as much as possible, you may even make them like, some of them were really operating as diagrams. And I thought that was great. Don't be afraid of like annotating your drawings, especially in this format, because sometimes the audio drops out. And so for those of you like Alexander, who didn't have the clearest audio, we were still able to follow because there was still some uh, lo logic to what was on the screen. Um, and then I've taught tons of speculative studios. And I think that it really requires a like a, an embracement of bravery, um, which is a challenge. You really can't rely on the things you've known all this time. So um, I appreciate that uh, both um, from all the students and the and your professor. Um, and like Francisca said, I was thrilled that these were so optimistic in a time when, like, if never before, there's been a time to be like like uh, uncertain and maybe dystopic about the environment of our future or now. Um, all of the projects we saw today were largely like happy. And maybe that's because we started out with the fun house. And so that sort of set the tone. Um, but all of, almost all of my speculative projects one year in a perfectly normal year when everything was just fine, all were like, and in the end of the world, we'll all have to do this. So thank you guys for, for not doing that today. I really appreciate it. And I enjoyed your presentations and I'm happy that I was able to be a part of those. Thank you, Amber. Yeah, I would just say that, uh, the fir firstly, it was, it was nice to see a little bit of what, what you all have been doing besides my Construction 4 class, you know, to get a glimpse <laughs> into how the other half lives or how, you, how the other half of your, your life, or maybe bigger than half of your life, uh, has been. And, and so, so that, that was really nice to get to see that, that side of, of you all. And, and, I, and I, I do think, just to reiterate uh, what... Um, but Amber and Francisco are saying that, you know, there's just, there is, it was really enjoyable work to see and, and it has its inherent challenges. And I think one of the things that you learn is sometimes when you're liberated of certain types of constraints, is there still are challenges anyway. And sometimes the more freedom that you're given, and it's, it, 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 which is the case in the speculation, you're given a lots of freedom. And as a result, now you're responsible for all of your decisions that you, you make, as opposed to if you were given a very tight program and a very tight construction system and a very tight, 
at some point it eliminates you from having to be responsible for those things. And so uh, it, it's, it's an interesting uh, sliding scale that mm-hmm. happens in terms of how much speculation versus reality is. But in, in, but in any case, you can't get away from the aspect that there are challenges and, you, and it's important to embrace those. And I think you all did that. And one of the things to mention that most of you said at some point, you mentioned that you know if there was more time, maybe I would have done this and this and this. And uh, not to be a spoiler for you, but there's never enough time on any project. Almost. <laughs> it's, it's, there's always gonna be a deadline that yeah. is uh, that will force you to pace yourself and make decisions. And, and, and that deadline will never allow you to explore everything in detail. At some point you have to prioritize and decide What's the most important thing that I absolutely want to make sure is resolved as much as possible in this project and let that help to set in motion other things. But knowing that uh, even if you did have two more weeks now or three more weeks to four more weeks, you would be able to solve some things, but you would still be up against that deadline and there'd be new things you haven't resolved. Mm-hmm. And, and that's fine. And, and, and it's something you have to, you have to embrace and, and use as a way to help you structure your decision sets. The way, the way that you uh, set up hierarchies within your schemes. And so um, that time component, and, 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 and to be fair, of course, you did have more challenges in terms of time than most studios. I'm just saying that this will always be something throughout your academic career and professional career. And deadlines uh, help us to structure our work in some ways. And the more we can embrace that, the better off we are. So um, just thought I would mention that, but again, uh, great work. It was good to see you all, and congrats on the end of end of the semester, at least the end of studio. Thank you all. Terrific comments. Thanks, Peter. Thanks yeah. Danielle, also. It was great. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you, the students could just stay on for a few more minutes, um, Amber, I'll talk to you another time soon. Um, that sounds great. We'll be Thanks in touch. Good. All right. Bye, nice meeting you, Amber. Nice to meet you too. Thanks. Good to see you all. Have a good summer. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you.